Hello friends. Welcome to the Muse fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see title. What if Nordo inherited the heavenly blessed chakra of sage of six paths? But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Team 7, under Master Jiraiya, will be Minato Namikaze, Kashina Uzumaki and Jin Serutobi. The teacher said, reading off her clipboard. Jiraiya was in a tree outside the academy looking into the classroom that housed his three would be Jenin. Hearing the name of his students, Jiraiya looked at the three. First up was Minato Namikaze. The boy had shaggy blonde hair and blue eyes. If Jiraiya had his information right, the kid was an orphan but had a very prestigious mind. Not surprising in the least since he made Rookie of the Year. Next on the list was the lone female of the group, Kashina Uzumaki. Kashina had long crimson red hair, a common trait amongst the Uzumaki, and purple eyes. According to her record, Kashina had a nasty temper, usually brought on by being called a tomato on account of her red hair and round face. She reminded Jiraiya of his teammate Tsunade. Despite this, Kashina was a very skilled Kunoichi, or she would be when Jiraiya was done with her. Last on the list was Jin Serutobi. Jin had shoulder length auburn brown hair, brown tinted skin, typical of a Serutobi, and green eyes with a pointed mark at the bottom corner of each eye. Jiraiya knew this kid well, he was the oldest of his sensei's three children. The academy instructors said he was lucky to pass as he was terrible with the clone jutsu. In hindsight, not Jin's fault. Hailing from the Serutobi clan, he naturally had a large quantity of chakra and therefore could not control it to the point where he needed the little amount of chakra it took to make the clone jutsu. The Serutobi clan were chakra monsters and often had trouble with low level jutsu, either overloading them or outright failing to use them. Jin, on the other hand, seemed to have trouble with jutsu that he as a Serutobi should excel at. The kid had no talent whatsoever. Not to mention the pressure the kid probably had due to being the Hokage's son. He reminded Jiraiya of himself. Jiraiya smiled, this would be fun. Zero 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 after gathering his students Jiraiya took them to the roof for introductions. Okay kids, from here on out we're gonna be working together so we should get to know one another better with introductions. I'll start us off. Jiraiya said, only to do a completely ridiculous kabuki style dance that left all his students sweat dropping. This guy's an idiot, was their unanimous thought. All right. Your turn. You start us off blondie, Jiraiya said pointing at Minato. Minato sweat dropped at the nickname. My name is Minato Namikaze. I like training and inventing new jutsu. I dislike needless fights and bullies. My dream for the future is to be an excellent shinobi, Minato said with a soft smile. Jiraiya smiled. He'd like this kid. He turned his attention to Kashina. Next up, Tomato. Kashina grew a tick mark at the name but calmed herself. My name is Kashina Uzumaki. I like salt ramen, pulling pranks, chatting with friends and Mito Bachan. I dislike bullies, anything bitter and hate the name Tomato. She said glaring at Jiraiya. My dream for the future is to be the first female cage. Believe it, she finished with a verbal tick. Jiraiya's sweat dropped at both the glare and the verbal tick but chose not to comment while also making a mental note to keep this girl away from Tsunade at all cost. Jiraiya turned to the last member. Last but not least, Monkey Boy. Jin's eye twitched at the name. My name is Jin Serutobi, he growled before taking a deep breath. My likes include hot things, my little sister Hitomi, my baby brother Asuma and my mom. My dislikes include my shitty pops, snakes, fangirls and bigots. My dream for the future is to break out of my father's shadow and be recognized as me, Jin said. Jiraiya looked taken aback. Why so much animosity towards sensei? He thought, though he didn't miss the way Jin practically spat the word snakes out. Must have something to do with Orochimaru, which now that I think about it, makes sense. Jiraiya thought, inwardly frowning. It was no secret to the Sanin that out of Hiruzen's three students, Orochimaru was his favorite. A fact that irked Jiraiya to no end, especially since the third saw the snake as his own son. Now being that Jin actually was one of the third's two true sons, Jin more than likely had to deal with the old monkey shunning him in favor of Orochimaru. 
it would certainly explain his loathing of Orochimaru as well as his old man. Not to mention Jin's supposed lack of talent compared to Orochimaru's genius. Jiraiya shook his head from his thoughts and smiled at his genin. Those are great names and great goals. Listen up kids, I've decided, that I'm going to make sure your names are legend. Usually we're supposed to do an exam to make sure you're compatible, but I can tell already that you're all capable. So from here on out, we're team 7. But more importantly than that, we're a family. Jiraiya said, gaining smiles from his genin students. 000 Team 7 had been together for a couple weeks now. Jiraiya used those two weeks to get an idea how the kids' individual skills were and how they learned. Minato had excellent taijutsu that seemed to rely on speed and counters. His jutsu list, while small, was good for his skill level and anything Jiraiya had him learn didn't take long for him to master. Kashina was a bit headstrong and tended to act rashly but she could be serious when the time called for it. Kashina was a more hands-on learner type, mostly shown by her unpredictable, brawler-style fighting. Kashina learned jutsu through trial and error but generally had a good grasp on what she was doing. Where she really shined however were the ceiling arts, not a huge surprise given her Uzumaki heritage. No what surprised Jiraiya was how the normally brash red head could calmly sit still and make seals from scratch. Sadly Jiraiya could do nothing about her temper. Jin proved to be the problem student, not in attitude mind you. Jin's taijutsu was good and he was quite skilled at bojutsu. Jin's problem came in with nin and genjutsu. No matter how much he trained, Jin simply sucked when it came to jutsu. It was after the first week that Jiraiya finally figured out the problem. Even by Serutobi standards, Jin had a shit ton of chakra with little to no control of it. If Jiraiya had to estimate it, right now at age 10, Jin had as much chakra as his father Hiruzen, age 42, but had the control of a beginning academy student. Jiraiya had a similar problem at his age and the thing that helped him was accidentally reverse summoning himself to Mount Myoboku and learning from the toads. Jiraiya wondered if a similar solution could be made for Jin. That in mind, Jiraiya taught Jin the hand signs to the summoning jutsu, figuring that when they got Jin's control to the point necessary, he could send himself to whatever animal he was attuned to and learn from them. That was the plan but it took an extra week to get Jin's chakra to the level required before he did the summoning jutsu and was on his merry way. Jiraiya knew from experience that the boy would be gone for at least a couple days so he thought of what he could teach his other two students in the meantime. Jiraiya wondered what animal Jin was attuned to. 000 Unknown Location Jin had appeared in a puff of smoke over an island with a vast jungle with a large active volcano in the center that had a constant flow of lava flowing from it. As he fell, Jin rejoiced slightly at the heat of the area, what with the volcano and the blazing sun overhead. When he reached the trees, he fell through them and was unable to get a grip on a branch. Jin hoped the ground wasn't too hard when he suddenly landed on something soft and furry with a grunt. Sitting up, he felt the strange golden grass he landed on and wondered why it felt like hair. His thoughts on the grass went out the window when heard a growl as the land shifted. Turning around, he came face to snout with a giant monkey-like creature. Holy shit! Was his thought when he saw the giant ape and realized he had landed on it. The ape didn't look like your average monkey. For one thing, its face was long and somewhat baboon-like as opposed to the flat human-like face of other monkeys. Its body seemed to be related more to a gorilla with its muscular frame, but it had a long monkey tail swishing behind it. If that wasn't enough, there was also the shimmering red eyes as well as the fact that the ape was at least 50 feet tall. The ape had managed to snag Jin by the back of his shirt and moved him to the front of his face to better see him. Well now, this is interesting. What is a human child doing on Mount Pauzu? Its deep voice sounded. Jin was sweating bullets, but managed to answer. Sorry for disturbing you, I was trying out the summoning jutsu and suddenly poofed here because I'm not signed with an animal. I'm Jin Serutobi, might I ask your name? A rumble sounded in the monkey's chest that sounded suspiciously like a chuckle. You certainly have manners. I am Sun Gohan. One. Son of the Yanbi. Son Goku and head of the Uzaru. The now named Gohan said with pride. Great apes huh, never heard of them, and did he just say he was the son of the Yanbi? Hey, wait a minute, I thought the biju were giant masses of chakra given form? While that is correct, the biju do have physical bodies and as such are capable of breeding. 
though their children do not become biju, but normal animals. 2. I believe my father is the only tailed beast to reproduce. Gohan explained. Oh, okay. Um, where does that leave me? Jin asked nervously. No one could really blame him for being nervous in front of a giant ape that was the son of a biju. Gohan looked at Jin thoughtfully. You are not the first human to arrive here to Mount Paozu. However, while we do have a summoning scroll, no one has ever survived our test to sign it. Do you think you'll be any different? Gohan asked. Now Jin was intrigued. What test? Gohan moved Jin do that he was now in the palm of his hand then moved to the base of the volcano. As Gohan walked, Jin looked around and took in the beautiful landscape. He'd heard that volcanic soil was extremely fertile but he'd never been to a place near enough to a volcano to find out if it were true or not. While admiring the jungle, Jin saw the other Uzaru. The Uzaru came in all manner of shapes and sizes and were generally red, brown or yellow. Some were about as big as spider monkeys and others as big as Gohan but not nearly as muscular and with bigger bellies. As both boy and ape got closer to the volcano, Jin could make out what looked like an altar with a blazing green flame. When they arrived, Gohan began to speak. This is the sacred flame altar. The sacred flame will judge you. Should you walk through the flame and walk out the other side, you will be made worthy of being the summoner of the Uzaru. However, should you fail, the flame will reduce you to ashes. Gohan explained. Jin was standing in front of the fire, contemplating what to do. On the one hand, if he succeeded, he may finally have a way of gaining control of his chakra, however, if he failed, his shinobi career would come to an abrupt halt. He fingered his leaf headband which he wore around his neck and smiled. Hey, I'm a shinobi of the hidden leaf village, for all I know I could die tomorrow. What's life without a bit of risk? He said as he jumped into the flame without a hint of fear and was consumed by the flames. Gohan's red eyes narrowed, it appears I was wrong about him. 000 back in Konoha. A week had passed since Jin had done the reverse summoning jutsu and disappeared. Jiraiya was getting increasingly anxious the longer Jin was away. It wasn't just Jiraiya either, Minato and Kashina were worried as well, along with Bawako and Hitomi Serutobi. What made it worse was that Jiraiya had no idea where Jin went. The remaining members of Team 7 were at their training ground but neither Minato or Kashina really felt like training, too worried about their lost teammate. Jiraiya Sensei. When exactly is Jin supposed to return? Kashina asked. Jiraiya didn't know what to tell Kashina. Jiraiya foolishly made an assumption and it seemed his student was paying for it. Just as Jiraiya was about to say something, a cloud of smoke appeared on the field. When the smoke dissipated, a disheveled Jin was revealed. Jin was was missing his shirt, showing his upper body that seemed more muscular and defined than when he left. His pants were tattered and the left leg from the knee down was missing. He was barefoot and he had several bruises on his body. His headband was clutched in his left hand while a giant scroll was over his right shoulder. Despite the fact that he looked beaten to hell, Jin had a shit-eating grin on his face. Yo, hope I didn't worry you guys, he said cheekily. It took all of Jiraiya's willpower not to throttle his student. Of course that didn't really stop Kashina from doing it. 000 After calming down Kashina and getting over the shock of seeing the state of his student, Jiraiya practically carried Jin to the hospital, followed by a worried Minato. Jiraiya sent Kashina to get his parents. Luckily for Jiraiya, his old teammate Tsunade was on duty and could see to Jin immediately. Ultimately it seemed that despite his injuries, Jin was in perfect health and in better shape than when he left. During Tsunade's examination, Jin explained how he was sent to a place called MT. Paozu and came across creatures called Uzarus. Jin explained how he was the first to pass the Uzaru's test and was allowed to sign their summon contract. He went on to explain that in the week he was there, the Uzaru wiped him into shape and helped him with his chakra control. When he told them of the training he endured for a week, Jiraiya paled slightly thinking it a bit extreme but ultimately let it go when he remembered the training he went through with the toads. Near the end of Jin's healing session, Kashina arrived with Jin's mother Bawako, who was carrying her youngest child, two-year-old Asuma in her arms while her daughter, six-year-old Hitomi, was following close behind. Jiraiya was a bit disappointed to note that his sensei hadn't come. Hokage or not, his son was in the hospital. Jiraiya was really beginning to see why Jin had such a problem with his father. After waving off his mother's and sister's worries, 
Jin took notice of how much closer Kashina stood to Minato. When he asked if he'd missed something in his absence, Minato told him that while he was gone, Kashina had been kidnapped by Ninja from the Hidden Cloud Village. Luckily for her Minato recognized the strands of hair she was leaving behind and saved her before they got to the border. Jin was happy for them, he knew Minato harbored a secret crush on Kashina since they were in the academy but was too scared of the girl to say anything. A few days later when Jin was given the okay to leave the hospital, the team went through their normal warm-ups followed by sparring. Jin truly showed how much he changed in the week he was gone during his spar with Minato. Normally Minato could beat Jin with minimal effort. Now however, Jin was giving Minato a run for his money. Of course, no matter how good the two were, they stood no match for Kashina, who promptly pummeled both of them. All in all, Jiraiya was thoroughly enjoying teaching his students and wasn't looking forward to when they got older and no longer needed him. 0004 years later, 10 years before Kayubi, and now 14-year-old Jin was zigzagging through trees to get to the secret training ground he and his teammates and P. Suedo brother and sister created years ago when they first became Chunin when they were 11 on their first try at the Chunin exams. As of right now, Minato was the only one on the team who had become a Jonin at age 13. Jin could be considered a Jonin in all but ranking as he had yet to take the actual Jonin exams, 3. Unlike the Chunin exams, the Jonin exams required either the permission of the Hokage or the recommendation of five Jonin level ninja. Jin knew he could pass the exams with little to no difficulty as he was easily as powerful as Minato as neither could ever beat the other in a spar anymore, but he only knew four of the five required Jonin level ninja that would recommend him so that meant he needed the Hokage's permission. This posed a problem as his shitty pops, despite seeing evidence of Jin's skills and personal growth, wouldn't give Jin the permission to take the exams justifying his decision by saying he wasn't yet at the level necessary. Jin nearly threw a fit when he heard that, he was the only one on his team that hadn't received the Hokage's permission. Seeing his son's angered state, Hiruzen told Jin that if all three of his students gave Jin a recommendation then he'd let Jin take the exams. That pissed Jin off even more as he knew only two of the three Sanin would recommend him for John and as Orochi Teme could hardly ever be found. Jin knew the only hope he had would be when Kashina became a Jonin. Luckily for Jin, Kashina was currently taking her Jonin exam so hopefully she passes. Jin was wearing a black version of the standard Konoha uniform but with a sleeveless shirt with bands on his biceps and black wristbands along with his Chunin vest which he wore open, showing his skin-tight shirt as it clung to his muscled frame. Jin's hair was a bit longer with the top swept back while the rest was pulled into a small tail. His headband was worn around his neck like a collar. Jin had just dropped his siblings, Hitomi, who was about to graduate, and Asuma, who was about to finish his first year, off at the academy and was eager to get to the training grounds with his findings. Let's see, pass all the markings in the trees until you reach the X then make a left and then. Jin recited in his head until he reached his destination. If anyone were following him, they'd see that he just vanished in thin air when in actuality he entered a training field hidden by a genjutsu built into a seal that spanned a five mile radius. The training field was a wide open area with a few trees, hard soil patches and a lake, perfect for elemental training. Between the three of them, Minato, Jin and Kashina had all five elemental chakra natures. Minato had lightning and fire, Jin had fire and earth and Kashina had wind and water. Each of them had an element that complemented the other which only made their already flawless teamwork better. However, unlike his teammates, Jin had such a strong connection to his elemental affinities that he had the ability to combine them and create the sub-element lava, 4. As soon as he got to the training ground, Minato was there waiting for him. Minato's hair was much spikier than four years ago along with two jaw-length bangs framing his face. Minato was wearing the standard Konoha uniform with two bands on each arm and his Jonin vest. Minato looked up when he sensed Jin's approach. There you are. What took you so long? Minato asked. I had to drop off Hitomi and Asuma. Jin answered as he took two scrolls from his vest. Anyway, I got the jutsu we were talking about. Wasn't easy breaking into the old man's office but I did it. He said tossing one of the scrolls to Minato. Minato caught it and opened the scroll. TCH, and that old monkey won't give you the recommendation to be a Jonin. He commented as he read the scroll for both the Kanai and Shuriken Shadow clone jutsu. Trust me, I know. Even mom said he was being a moron. In any case, 
I took a look at the seal work for the second Hokage's jutsu and I think we'll need Kashina's help with breaking it. As good as we are with seals we're not masters like her or Jiraiya sensei. Jin said holding up the other scroll. Minato looked up from the scroll he was reading. Is it really that hard? I mean it's just a supplementary seal isn't it? That may be so but it's also a space-time technique, those are incredibly tricky. It's not like the summoning jutsu where we're bringing something to us. The idea is to vanish into a separate dimension at light speed and come out wherever the seal is placed. Jin explained. Minato shrugged. Well I guess we'll wait for Kushi-chan. She's supposed to be back tomorrow. In the meantime, let's work on these jutsu. Minato said as he sat down the scroll as he and Jin walked towards some trees. When Kashina returned the next day, she was sporting her brand new Jonin vest. Jin practically hugged her to death. Now that Kashina was a Jonin, Jin now had five Jonin that could give him the recommendation to the Jonin exams. With the recommendation from Jiraiya, Tsunade, his mother Bawako, Minato, and now Kashina, Jin took his Jonin exams and a week later walked into his team's personal training ground with a Jonin vest. The three of them were then treated to dinner by Jiraiya as all his students had become excellent shinobi. 0004 years later, six years before Kayubi. Much had happened in the four years since Jin and Kashina became Jonin, both inside and out of the village. As far as the old team Jiraiya went, Minato and Jin, with Kashina's help, managed to recreate the second Hokage's jutsu. However, Minato took to it like a fish to water and derived several jutsu from it, who knew Minato had a hidden talent for space-time jutsu. Jin however wasn't as fond of the technique as Minato was and kept it on the back burner to use only in times of emergency. Another thing Minato was famous for was his own jutsu the Rasengan. A spiraling orb of pure chakra that drilled into an opponent. While Jin didn't use the second's jutsu, he did have his own trump card. A year after he made Jonin, he took a leave of absence and spent it at MT. Paozu to learn more jutsu from the Uzaru, what he wasn't expecting was for them to teach him about senjutsu. Jin had heard about senjutsu from Jiraiya when he briefly spoke of it, but Jin assumed it was something only taught by the toads, apparently he was wrong. The training wasn't as bad as he thought it would be. Apparently the Uzaru's way of gathering natural energy was more efficient than many of the other summonings but came with a price. The use of this energy caused a transformation that was referred to as sage mode. After learning how to do it, Jin immediately went to Minato and told him to receive, sage, training. Regarding Jin's family life, there were good times and bad. Jin and Hiruzen hardly saw each other anymore outside of the mission room as Jin had moved out of the Serutobi clan compound when he turned 16. Bawako made it a point to see her son every chance she got, an easy feat now that she was retired from the ninja ranks and worked full time at the hospital. Bawako had also taken Hitomi under her wing for as soon as Hitomi graduated from the academy four years ago, she immediately enrolled at the hospital to become a medical ninja. Asuma, who had just recently graduated from the academy, practically worshipped the ground Jin walked on, stating that he wanted to be a strong shinobi like his older brother. Jin wasn't going to lie, he took some smug satisfaction when Asuma said this as their father was in the room as well and flinched slightly at Asuma's praise for his older brother. In the outside world, the Thrid Great Ninja War started a few years ago. The main villages in the war were Konoha and Suna fighting against Kumo and Iwa. So far Kiri seemed to be keeping to itself in the war. Minato's expert use of the jutsu on the battlefield earned him the moniker, Konoha's yellow flash, as the only thing people saw was a yellow flash. The use of Jin's destructive jutsu, bojutsu and summonings had earned him many titles, but the one that seemed to stick was, Konoha's Flame Emperor. A moniker he gained when several leaf shinobi witnessed him cover an entire battlefield in nothing but fire and lava. Minato and Jin were both feared for their talents, it was rumored in Konoha that they were turning the tide of the war on their own. On their own they were deadly, but together, they were an unstoppable force of nature. It was rumored that they were stronger than the Sanin. Right now, Minato and Jin were in the Hokage's office with several other Jonin to receive their Genin teams. 000. Minato Namikaze, you'll be in charge of Team 7, consisting of Kakashi Hitaki, Rin Nohara, and Obito Uchiha. Hiruzen said as he handed a folder to Minato. Minato took it with a small smile on his face. Hiruzen proceeded to list off the other names of the team members for the other Jonin before he got to Jin. 
Jin Serutobi, you'll be in charge of Team 11, consisting of Might Guy, Genma Shiranui and Shizun Kato. Hiruzen said as he handed his son the folder. Whatever Jin was thinking was unknown as his face portrayed nothing, he merely took the folder and walked over toward Minato. After a few more words, the Hokage dismissed the Janin. Minato and Jin were making a leisure pace to the academy to pick up their students. Minato hadn't changed in the last four years other than getting taller as he stood just below six feet, standing at five feet eleven with a runner's build. His face had got more angular and sharper, combined with his spiky blonde locks, Minato was quite the handsome man, often receiving appraising looks from the female populace. Unfortunately for them, Minato never looked at another the way he looked at Kashina, who had recently become his wife. Jin's appearance had changed slightly over the years. Jin's hair was shorter now, reaching to the base of his neck and swept back in messy spikes except for two bangs that framed his face, giving him a wild look. 5. As a result of his sage training, Jin now had a furry brown monkey-like tail and both his upper and lower canine teeth were slightly larger, adding to his wild look. Jin stood at 6 feet 3 with a muscular athletic build. Jin was now wearing baggy forest camo pants tucked into black ninja sandals with a kanai and shuriken holster on the right leg. He wore a skin-tight black sleeveless shirt with his janin vest over it unzipped. He wore black fingerless gloves with studs on the knuckles to add more damage. He had a red bow staff in a red sheath tied to his back and the Uzaru summoning contract slung across his lower back. His headband was tied around his neck and his tail was wrapped around his waist. While Minato got admirers, mostly because people generally knew he was dating Kashina, Jin got followers from the opposite sex since everyone assumed he was single. Of course Minato was the only one who knew otherwise. When exactly am I going to meet this woman in your life? Minato asked his brother in all but blood when they passed by a group of women who giggled in their direction. Jin sighed. I don't know, it might not be until after this war is over. That took Minato by surprise. Why, is there some problem I don't know about? Jin was quiet for a moment before he answered. She's not from Konoha, he said. Minato shrugged. Okay, so she's from one of the minor villages in the Land of Fire, that explains why you're always using the small Uzaru monkeys to deliver letters. Where's she from? Taki? Kuso? Jin muttered something. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Jin sighed. I said she's from Suna, he said quietly. Minato's brows raised in surprise. Wow, talk about long distance. Well that's not so bad, we're allied with them after all. Maybe so, but war breeds mistrust and I don't want some moron jumping to conclusions if they see a Suna Kunoichi around the village, Jin explained. HMPH, if it's that much trouble, why not find someone from the village? Minato asked. This coming from the guy who married the girl from Uzu, Jin shot back. Touche. When they got closer to the academy, the conversation changed. Listen Minato, keep an eye on that Kakashi kid, Jin said in a serious tone. Minato raised a brow. What do you mean? I mean that kid doesn't care for the welfare of his comrades like a leaf shinobi should. He took his father's suicide as a message that a shinobi must put the mission before his comrades, Jin said. Minato looked shocked. Surely it's not that bad. Jin gave Minato a serious look. I had the displeasure of being on a team with that little shit once. One of our comrades was injured and he suggested I leave him behind. The only reason I didn't beat him within an inch of his young life was because Sakumo was a good friend. You need to break him of that or he'll wind up getting one of his comrades killed. Minato nodded. I'll do what I can. What are you going to do about Guy? I mean he can only use Taijutsu? And, I'll make sure he's the best damn Taijutsu user in the village, Jin said. While we're speaking of Taijutsu, do you know why his father Mai Dui is still a genin? That man could easily be a janin with Taijutsu alone, Minato inquired. Jin narrowed his eyes. My father in his infinite wisdom isn't sure Dui could be a janin with only Taijutsu. There are janin that are who mainly use ninjutsu and some that mainly use genjutsu, but someone comes along and only uses Taijutsu and suddenly there's a problem, he said. There are several things that don't make sense about the, the village's politics. Things that old monkey is too foolish to see. Minato looked thoughtful for a moment. Well how about this then? He trailed off as he got Jin's attention. 
Kushi Chan doesn't really care for being Hokage anymore as she really just wanted to be acknowledged as a Konoha shinobi and not the village outsider. Okay, you're not telling me anything I don't already know, Jin said confused. Minato chuckled slightly. My point is, you and I are two of the most powerful shinobi in the village let alone the world, one of us could be on the list for the fourth Hokage. Let's make a vow, that should one of us become the Hokage, we change this village's politics and make the village better, Minato said. Jin didn't look all that convinced. As strong as he was, he doubted he could be Hokage. Minato on the other hand probably could do it. With that thought, he smiled. I doubt I'd make a good Hokage, but tell you what. When you're Hokage, I'll be your personal advisor. But don't expect me to fetch your paperwork. Minato smiled. Deal. He said as he bumped fist with his P. Suedo brother. 000 After picking up their students, Minato and Jin split to training grounds 7 and 11 respectively. Once he and his team arrived, Jin made four earth pillars for him and his students to sit on. Jin sat on his pillar, faced his genin and spoke. Okay guys, and girl, I say we start with introductions. I'm Jin Serutobi. My likes include Heat, Monkeys, my little sister Hitomi, my baby brother Asuma, my mother, a certain someone in my old team and second family, Jiraiya of the Sanin, Minato Namikaze and Kashina Uzumaki. My dislikes include my shitty pops, snakes, senseless violence and cold places. As for my dream, well I've already fulfilled it so it's a mood point. Now on to you three. Genma, why don't you start us off? Jin said motioning to the boy on his left. Genma has brown, shoulder-length hair which hangs about his face and brown eyes. He's wearing a dark, baggy outfit with a hooded red and black jacket with his headband worn as a bandana. He's also wearing a strap around his leg and has a senbon in his mouth. Genma shrugged. My name is Genma Shiranui. I like taking long walks in quiet places. I dislike loud noises and ignorant people. My dream for the future is to make Jonin. Jin nodded at the boy. So he prefers a simple lifestyle. Nothing wrong with that. He thought before motioning to the next boy. Guy, you're up next. Guy has black hair in a shoulder length shaggy bowl cut hairstyle and large eyebrows. He's wearing a green spandex training suit with orange leg warmers and tape wrapped around his hands to his forearms. His headband is worn as a belt and he has a brownish red scarf around his neck. Yosh, I'm my guy. I like training, my father, challenging my eternal rival Kakashi and youthful things. I dislike unyouthful things. My dream for the future is to be a splendid ninja while using only taijutsu. Jin Sweat dropped a guy's answer. Geez this kid is loud, I can tell Genma's gonna be stressed out a bit and that youthful shit is gonna get really old, really fast. Jin thought before nodding at Guy and turning to the lone female of the group who seemed to blush whenever she glanced at him. Ah, how cute. She's got a little crush on me. Sorry little lady, you're too late and too young. Shizun, you're up. Shizun has straight black shoulder length hair with bangs that cover her ears and a fringe that falls over her forehead. Shizun is wearing a blue battle kimono with a pink ribbon around her waist. She cleared her throat. I'm Shizun Kato. I like nature and sightseeing. I dislike creepy people. My dream for the future is to be a great medic. She said, not quite meeting Jin's eye. Jin smiled. Those are all great dreams. It seems I just gained a new dream. My dream for the future is to make sure all of you make your dreams come true. Usually we John and Sensei are supposed to give you students a test to see if you can survive in the field, but I believe with the right training, anyone can survive. So with that said, we are now officially Team 11. Look to the person next to you, they are now a member of your family. Jin said causing his genin to smile as well. 000 two years later, four years before Kayubi. The third great ninja war was at an end and victory was in favor of Konoha. The victory was not without its prices though. On a mission to destroy that canopy bridge that Kakashi was leading, Minato's student Obito Uchiha was killed. Before he died, he gifted Kakashi with a Sharingan to replace the eye he lost on the same mission. As if things weren't bad enough for Team 7, a few months later, another of Minato's students, Rin, was killed unintentionally by Kakashi when she deliberately stepped in front of Kakashi's attack. It was found out later that Rin was kidnapped by Kiri, who had joined the war with Iwa and Kumo, and unwillingly made into an unstable Jinchuriki. 
It was Kiri's plan to send her back to Konoha where the beast would be released and rampage through the village. Not wanting that to happen, Rin died to protect the village. Team Eleven was also affected by the war. Both Guy and Shizun lost an important loved one. Shizun lost her uncle Dan who was the sole family member she had left. Jin remembered that day as he spent the entire night with his team trying to comfort the poor distraught girl. Jin could only imagine what Tsunade was going through as Dan was her lover and died in her arms. A week later, Shizun paid him a visit and with a heavy heart informed him that she was leaving the village with Tsunade as to travel the world and learn from her. Jin didn't want to see his student go but told her to follow her heart and wished her good luck on her journey. Jin was peeved however when Shizun's replacement came in the form of a stick in the mud named Ebisu. Guy later lost his father, Mike Dewey when all three of his students were on a secret mission while Jin was with Minato on the front lines. The three new Chunin had a run in with the seven swordsmen of the mist. This encounter would have spelled doom for his students if not for Dai's arrival. Using the eight inner gates. Gate of death. Dewey pushed the Kiri mercenaries back, killing three of them in the process before he died. Guy, took his father's death in stride as he dove into his training as to make his father proud. After the war ended the third Hokage decided it was time to name a successor. There was a surprisingly short list for him to choose from, chosen from the shinobi clan heads and Jonin councils, only three names were available. Orochimaru of the Sanin, Minato Namikaze and Jin Serutobi. Initially shocked that his name was on the short list for Hokage, Jin politely dropped out of the running, figuring Minato had the best chance at winning and figuring he'd do a much better job. It was soon after that Minato Namikaze was named the fourth Hokage, much to Orochimaru's anger. The village was prospering well under Minato's reign, for how short he was in office, he already made several much needed changes. Unfortunately not all was well in Konoha, for year after Minato was made Hokage, a discovery was made and a rift like no other was made in the relationship of father and son Serutobi that could never be fixed. Orochimaru had been discovered to be doing inhumane experiments on children that he'd kidnapped. Hiruzen led a team of Anbu through Orochimaru's secret lab to either detain or kill him. Hiruzen however allowed Orochimaru to get away. When he went to report back to Minato, all hell broke loose. Flashback. What do mean he got away, Serpring Lee, or not? It was not Minato who yelled but Jin. How could he have gotten away from you? There was only one exit from the lab. The only way he could have got away is if you let him go, Jin bellowed. Minato wanted to tell Jin to calm down as the temperature in the room was starting to rise but being his best friend since the academy had taught him that telling Jin to calm down often made the situation worse. Not a good thing when the angered one in question could stir up molten lava at will. Hokage Minato maybe, he wasn't stupid either. What's done is done. There's no changing it now, Hiruzen said impassively. That seemed to piss Jin off even more. Tell that to the families of the Anbu members who you got killed for no reason. Jin yelled. Kami, I can't believe this. He was experimenting on children, children, and you let him go. What if Hitomi was one of the people he was experimenting on, or Asuma? I know what happened. I was there. I saw the remains of those children and I don't need to be reminded of my mistake especially not from you, Hiruzen yelled back angry. It was quiet in the room now and Minato was sure that both Serutobi men forgot he was there as they glared at each other. Fine. Jin said quietly as he walked to the door before pausing and speaking over his shoulder. I have to ask. If it were me down there instead of Orochimaru, would you have still hesitated, or would you have killed me? Hiruzen didn't answer and his silence both spoke louder than any word and cut deeper than any blade ever could. Even Minato was shocked by the lack of an answer. HMPH, fine. I see how it is, Jin said as he walked out of the office. Flashback end. After that day, Jin hadn't spoke to his father since, and it wasn't just Jin who was angry, Asuma and Hitomi heard about what happened in the fight between their father and brother and when they found out their father's response, they stopped talking to him too. Bawako usually had a stern look on her face so no one knew if she were pissed or not. That was a year ago, currently Minato and Jin were in Minato's office going over paperwork. Minato did notice that Jin seemed to be a bit fidgety. Problem was, Jin and fidgety didn't belong in the same sentence. What's wrong with you? Minato asked. Jin sighed before he looked to Minato. I'll tell you when the others arrive. 
Minato was about to ask until there was a knock on the door. Enter. The door opened and Kashina and Jiraiya entered. Kushi chan, Jiraiya sensei. What are you two doing here? Kashina turned to Jin. Jin called us. What did you need to talk to all of us about? Jiraiya asked his old student. Jin walked to the door and placed a silent seal on it before he turned to his family. I need a favor. He trailed off as he saw he had their undivided attention. I need you guys to come with me to tea country. That got some raised brows. What's in tea country? Kashina asked. What surprised them all was the blush that appeared on his face. I'm a, I'm getting married, he said. It was quiet for a moment before. What? Everyone exclaimed. You heard me. I'm getting married in tea country and I really need you guys there, Jin said. Minato spoke up. Is this to the same girl from Suna? What girl from Suna? Jiraiya asked. You knew about this? Kashina asked her husband. I knew he was seeing someone from Suna for the last few years that I never met. Yes, it's the same girl from Suna and I need you three to be a witness, he said looking at Kashina. My best man, he said looking at Minato. And someone to officiate it. He finished looking at Jiraiya. I already have a seal there. I just need you guys to come with me for a few hours. The three looked at each other before smiling back at Jin. Of course we'll come, we're family, Kashina answered. With that done, Jin grabbed Jiraiya and Minato placed a seal on Jin before he grabbed Kashina. And the two used the flying Raijin Jutsu to tea country. 0004 years later, it had been four years since Jin's wedding. To this day, he still laughed at the look on everyone's face when they found out that the woman he was marrying was Pakura of the Scorch style. He wasn't sure why they were so surprised. They knew he loved heat, and who other than a lava style user was hotter than a Scorch style user. He did have to knock Jiraiya out at one point when he commented on Pakura's substantial bosom. He was gone from Konoha for two weeks on his honeymoon, but his return was met with surprise when he came back without his new wife. Jin informed them that Pakura didn't want to leave Suna yet as she still had a student there that she didn't want to leave behind until she was completely trained. Jin did make periodic trips out of the village over the years that the original Team 7 only knew about. Kashina learned around early February that she was pregnant. Jin and Minato were in the Hokage's office when she told them. Jin laughed when Minato passed out in shock. It wasn't a huge surprise when Jin was named the baby's godfather almost immediately after Minato regained consciousness. Months passed by quickly, and Jin was a bit worried about Bakura, he hadn't heard from her in a while. Last he heard from her was back in December, she said she had a long mission to go on and would contact him when she was done. He had asked his sensei to keep an eye out for her while he was traveling. Right now he was having dinner with his team. Minato was sitting at the table reading their sensei's first book. So, you got a little over a month until your son is born, any idea what you're gonna name him? Jin asked as he sipped his tea. Actually, I kinda decided to name him after the hero in Jiraiya Sensei's book, Minato said as he sat the book. Jin blinked once, twice, thrice, then opened his mouth before closing it then spoke. You're gonna name your kid after a ramen topping? Jin deadpanned. Minato looked taken aback. What's wrong with it? Fish cake. He's gonna get beaten up in school, Jin said. Naruto. Kashina said as she walked out of the kitchen with her hand on her swollen belly. I think it's a wonderful name, she said with a radiant smile. Besides, it means maelstrom. Jin sighed. If you two say so. I always preferred the name of the hero's partner. Now that's a name. Yeah I'm gonna have to have a kid of my own soon, someone's gonna have to watch Lil Naruto's back, he said with a smile. Suddenly Jin tensed up. Minato and Kashina noticed. What's wrong? Minato asked concerned. Jin stood up. I'll be right back, he said as he ran out the door. Minato and Kashina looked at each other then shrugged. 000 Jin hopped from roof to roof to the familiar chakra he sensed. Being a sage had turned him into a sensory type ninja. One of the things his tail did was act as a radar making him very sensitive to the different chakras in the village. Someone who had never been to the village had just entered Konoha. While normally he wouldn't give the furry crack of a rat's ass if someone came to Konoha, he knew this chakra as if it were his own. The fact that he sensed it in the village meant something big had happened. He was also aware that he was being followed. When Jin sensed the familiar chakra stop moving he followed it to an abandoned building. 
He landed on the roof and saw a shrouded figure waiting for him. What are you doing here? He said as he approached the figure. The figure removed the hood on its head revealing a beautiful woman with dark green hair done up in a bun with orange bangs and pupilous brown eyes. The woman was none other than Bakura of the Scorch style and Jin's secret wife. She smiled as he approached. I had to see you. I have something of yours, she said. Jin looked confused until he noticed a bundle in her arms that seemed to move slightly. Jin suddenly paused in his steps, his eyes glued to the bundle in his wife's arms. He hadn't realized he started moving again until he was directly in front of Bakura and saw the slight opening in the bundle. That opening revealed a tiny face with a tuft of auburn hair. His eyes widened before he looked up at Bakura who was giving him a heartwarming smile before she handed him the child. Meet your son, she said. Taking the baby and holding him close, he was mesmerized by the baby's face that looked so much like his own. The baby's sleeping face scrunched up before his tiny eyes opened up, revealing a pair of vibrant green eyes that looked up at him. The baby stared at him for a few moments before it smiled a toothless smile. Jin's vision began to waver and he realized he had tears in his eyes. Pakura wiped them from his eyes. Why didn't you send a message telling me you were with child? Pakura frowned. I wanted to, believe me I did, but I remembered in your last letter of how stressed you were and I didn't want to potentially add to that. She said as she caressed her husband's face before looking down at the baby. I also went into hiding for a while. I could let the village know I was with child. I am or rather I was the only Scorch style user in the world. I didn't want them to try and take the baby. I figured he'd be safer with his father, she explained as she leaned into Jin's side. When? Jin asked. Last month, August 15th, she replied as they looked at the baby that was giggling in his father's arms. And his name? I thought you should name him, she replied. Jin looked at his son, his nameless son. What should I call you little one? He thought to himself before his earlier conversation with Minato struck him and he remembered the other character in his sensei's book, the hero's partner and best friend. Shiba. His name will be Shiba Serutobi. Pakura smiled. A good name. Jin finally tore his gaze away from his son and looked to his wife before bending down and kissing her as his tail wrapped around her waist. When he pulled away, he spoke. Are you finally here to stay? Pakura frowned. No, I'll stay till the morning but I must head back to Suna. As far as they know, I'm on an extended vacation and I must return soon. Jin sighed. Very well, he said before he looked off to the side. You eavesdroppers can come out now, he said. Suddenly a sheepish Minato who was carrying an equally sheepish Kashina landed on the roof. As soon as she was on her feet, Kashina was at Jin's side admiring the baby in his arms. Oh, look at him, he's so cute, she squealed. Minato pat Jin on the shoulder. Congrats bro, looks like Naruto really will have someone watching his back, Minato said. Jin smiled down at Shiba. Yeah, he said. Suddenly he felt something wrap around his arm and looked to see a brown monkey tail wrapped around his arm. Well that's surprising. He was born with it. I assumed it had something to do with you. Pakura said simply, apparently unbothered by her child having a tail. Suddenly Kashina appeared at her side. Say Pakura, between you and me, childbirth, does it hurt as much as they say it does? Kashina asked nervously. Pakura suddenly got a haunted look on her face. Nothing in your ninja training can prepare or compare to the pain of childbirth. You're pushing a tiny person out of your hoo-ha, she said making Kashina pale. Perhaps we can do this another time. I just got a son and I'll only have my wife till the morning. Jin said as he Pakura left for his apartment while Minato and Kashina left to their own. Jin had no idea that come morning, he would never see his wife again. 000 a month had passed without incident. So far Jin had introduced Shiba to his mother and sister, both of whom cooed over the baby and hit him upside the head for keeping his marriage a secret, his old students Guy and Genma and his surrogate father Jiraiya when he returned to the village to see his students. Asuma had yet to meet his nephew as he was on a mission and Hiruzen had yet to see his grandson because Jin wouldn't go anywhere near Hiruzen unless needed. He would later meet Shiba when Jin had his mother watch the baby while he handled a few problems. During the last month, Jin's attention had been split between taking care of Shiba and gathering preparations for Kashina's birth. What the general population of Konoha didn't know was that Kashina was the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi no Kitsune. 
The preparations were needed as Kashina's seal would weaken during childbirth. Jin questioned several times why they would even bother having female Jinchuriki if such a weakness was possible. After careful preparations, Kashina's due date had finally arrived. Currently Minato and Kashina were in their apartment with the third Hokage and Bawako, who was cuddling a sleeping Shiba in her arms. The elders were informing the young couple of how the birthing process would take place when Jin entered the apartment. Everything come together? Minato asked. Jin nodded as he took Shiba from his mother. Yup, drew the barrier seals myself, Jin said. And you're sure they will hold? Hiruzen asked. Jin barely spared the man a glance. Barrier jutsu are my specialty. Once Kashina is inside and the anbu replaced, the barrier will go up. Once that happens, the only way in or out would be with a space-time jutsu. Something only myself and Minato know how to do, Jin explained. Alright then, I better go on ahead and prepare the seal to keep the Kayubi at bay, Minato said as he stood up and both he and Jin left the apartment. When they were outside, Minato turned to Jin. Thank you for this. I couldn't ask for a better friend, he said as he clutched Jin's shoulder. Hey, we've been teammates and partners for 14 years and we've been friends our whole lives. You should know by now you never need to ask for anything. I have your back in this life and the next, Jin said with a smile. Now go on, I want my godson to be healthy, he said. Minato nodded with a smile before he left. Jin frowned as his tail furrowed. This is supposed to be a happy moment, so why can't I shake this sudden feeling of dread? Probably just my stress acting up again. I really need to do something about that, lest I start going gray, or bald, he thought as he went home with his son in his arms. 000 that evening, Jin was sitting in his home sipping tea by his window and reading a book while Sheba slept in his cot nearby. Jin lifted the teacup to his lips to drink only to pause when it suddenly chipped. Jin looked at the cup strangely. That's not a good sign, he thought. Suddenly his whole body tensed up as tail shot ramrod straight and bristled at the chakra he sensed. It was horrible, so vile and filled with anger and hatred. He'd only sensed this chakra once years ago when Kashina used its chakra. The Kayubi. Impossible, what happened to Minato and Kashina? He thought frantic as he sensed the beast's chakra. Suddenly, Shiba woke from a dead sleep and cried at the top of his lungs. Jin grabbed his son and rocked him gently. You sense it too, don't you Shiba, he said. Jin just knew something was wrong and quickly changed into his ninja gear. Just as he grabbed Shiba to take him someplace safe, a giant cloud of smoke appeared in the middle of the village and when it vanished, Jin stared in horror at the Kayubi no Kitsune in all its glory. Jin quickly fled his apartment and moved as far from the Kayubi as he could as the beast rampaged through the village, destroying everything in its path. How did the Kayubi get free with all our safeguards? Minato, Kashina, mother, please be okay. Jin hopped from roof to roof away from the Kayubi with a wailing Shiba in his arms. Jin needed to find a safe place to put Shiba. Suddenly he sensed Minato's chakra appear on the Hokage monument. The Kayubi saw him as well and fired a Bijudama at the monument only for Minato to redirect it with the flying region. Well Minato's okay. Wait, who's that up there with him? Jin thought as he sensed someone's chakra appear out of nowhere behind Minato before Minato suddenly vanished followed by the unknown. Is he fighting someone, whoever it is? Their chakra suddenly vanished as if he was using a space-time technique. They must have got through my barrier but how did they find the location, let alone know about Kashina? Jin raged in his head. He wanted to help Minato but he had to get the Kayubi out of the village but first he had to get Shiba to safety. Jin stretched out his senses before he finally sensed his little brother's chakra along with Gai, Genma and all the other young shinobi. Making a beeline for the area, Jin arrived to see his brother standing next to a red-eyed Kunoichi who was arguing with a Janin who Jin guessed was her father. As soon as he touched down, Asuma saw him. Nisan. He called getting the attention of the other shinobi. Jin strode up to him quickly. No time to talk, here. Jin said as he gently handed a confused Asuma a fussy Shiba. This is your nephew Shiba. I need you, Gai and Genma to keep an eye on him for me. He said loud enough so Gai and Genma could hear as well, causing them to move around Asuma to better see their sensei's son. Asuma looked at his nephew before looking up and seeing his brothers retreating back. Wait, Nisan. Where are you going? 
Jin looked over his shoulder as he walked off, to kick that giant fox out of our village, he said as he left. Jin made a beeline straight for the Kyubi. The third had some type of plan to drive the Kyubi away but Jin didn't have the time to wait for his father, organize the shinobi to launch a counter attack. Everyone pull back, he called to all the Konoha shinobi in front of him. Seeing the Hokage's advisor and second in command, all shinobi immediately pulled back. Taking a mighty leap when he was close enough, Jin was right over the fox. Pricking his finger, he weaved through hand signs. Summoning Jutsu. He called as giant gout of smoke appeared and suddenly a giant golden Uzaru with chest armor with a leaf insignia carved in it and a loincloth, six, landed on the Kyubi. What's the big idea summoning me in the air like that Jin? Gohan roared as he held down the Kyubi as it roared in outrage. Sorry, I had to make sure he was successfully pinned. Jin said as he hopped from Gohan's head and landed on the roof of a house. He pulled his staff from the sheath on the back and pointed it at the struggling Kyubi's side. Gohan, move now. Quickly the Uzaru jumped in the air. Power pole extend. Jin cried as the staff glowed red and extended far until it slammed into the Kyubi's side and promptly pushed the massive fox out of the village and into the surrounding forestry. The fox righted itself and roared in challenge when Gohan landed on the ground. Gohan roared right back as Jin hopped on his head. Let's go, Gohan. Right. The Uzaru said as it charged at the fox as it charged back. A shockwave hit when the ape and the fox met in the middle. Biju he may not have been. Gohan was the son of one and could hold his own against one. Exactly what is the plan here? Gohan questioned as it grappled with the fox. I'm working on this as we go along. Just keep him from the village. Jin yelled as he weaved through hand signs. Earth style. Dark swamp. The land around the Kyubi's back suddenly liquefied, causing the fox to sink and with Gohan holding its hands, the fox couldn't get its bearings. The fox was even more pissed now as it opened its maw wide as dark and light chakra formed into a sphere as it prepared to fire a bijudama at close range. Shit! Jin thought frantic as he clasped his hands together in a prayer fashion as his tail unwound from his waist and bristled as his green eyes turned amber. Senen Mo! Before Jin could finish, a giant toad Jin recognized as Gamabunta landed on the fox with Minato on top of it. Sorry I'm late, Minato called. The hell you been? Jin called out as he uncrossed his hands while his eyes turned back to normal. I was caught up by a man with an orange one-eyed mask and a sharingan. He had a strange space-time technique that allowed him to become intangible and teleport with a swirl. But that's not important now. Hold on, Minato said as he formed a seal and in a flash, he. The Kyubi and Jin vanished farther away from the village, leaving Bunta and Gohan behind. Some leaf shinobi that arrived to help watched as a giant explosion went off in the distance. 000 Minato teleported to the safe house that he hid a weakened Kashina and his newborn son Naruto. Minato was breathing hard from teleporting not only himself and Jin but the Kyubi as well. Kashina wasn't much better as she could barely move and looked two seconds from killing over. Jin however was still alert and saw the Kyubi regaining its bearings. Shit, I have to seal its movements. I'll have to use that barrier. But by myself I can only hold it for 5 minutes. Even if I used sage mode, I'd still barely add an extra 30 seconds. He thought as he formed a cross seal. Shadow clone jutsu. He called as three clones appeared and shot off, knowing their orders. One went to the fox's left, another to its right and the last behind it. The clones and the original all made the ram seal. Ninja art. Four crimson ray formation. Suddenly a large red square barrier appeared around the Kyubi. Minato, Kashina, if you guys have a plan you better do now, I can't hold this barrier for long, Jin called out. Minato and Kashina were having an argument about where to put the fox. Minato wanted to seal the biju inside their newborn Naruto. Kashina made the argument that Naruto would live a lonely life if he was made the Jinchuriki. Minato however countered her point by saying Naruto would have Jin and Shiba there for him, as reluctant as she was, Kashina agreed with Minato's plan. With his wife's support, Minato used the only seal strong enough to seal the Kyubi, the Reaper Death Seal. The plan was simple, use the Reaper Death Seal to seal the Dark Yin Chakra into himself until a time when Naruto was older to take the power and then have Jin seal the remaining Yang Chakra into Naruto now with the 8 Trigram Seal. 
Minato looked to Jin. Jin, when I say so, drop the barrier, I'm gonna use the Reaper Death Seal to seal half of the Kyubi's chakra inside of me. Have you lost your ing mind? Of all the seals you could use, that's the one you pick? Jin yelled back. It's the only way. When I do that, I need you to use the 8 trigrams seal to seal the remainder inside Naruto. Minato said. When he saw the disbelieving look Jin sent him, he spoke again. Yes, I know the burden I'm putting on Naruto, but that's why it's a good thing you're his godfather, you can protect him. Jin growled. If you weren't about to die, I swear I'd kill you. Fine, he said before turning to Kashina. Kashina, once I lift this barrier, use your chakra chains to hold the fox down. Got it. Kashina nodded. Jin turned back to the barrier and smirked. We can consider this our last mission as the original Team 7, we'd better go out with a bang, he said getting smirks from his teammates. Now, Minato yelled. Jin jumped back as his clones vanished and the seal shattered. Almost immediately, Kashina used what little strength she had left and created chakra chains to hold the Kyubi down as it roared in outrage, knowing what was about to happen. Jin and Minato both weaved through two different sets of hand seals. Reaper Death Seal Minato cried as the transparent hand of the Shinigami reached through him and ripped out the Kyubi's yin chakra, leaving the Kyubi half the size it was before, and sealing it inside Minato at the cost of his soul. 8 Trigrams Seal Jin cried as he sealed the remainder of the Kyubi, plus a bit of Minato and Kashina's chakra into the infant. It's over. Minato said falling over until Jin quickly caught him, and carried him over toward Kashina and laid him down next to her, where she moved so that her head was next to his. Jin moved to get Naruto and when he had the child in his arms, he took a moment to really look at his godson. Even though he was a newborn, Naruto already favored his father in the looks, though he got Kashina's round face and had a tuft of crimson red hair. Jin smiled at the baby before walking back over to his dying teammates so they could see their child one last time. Both parents admired their child with sad smiles knowing they wouldn't see him grow. Kashina looked up at a tearful Jin. You look after him right? She knew you would, but she just had to hear him say it. Jin sniffed but nodded. As if he were my own, he reassured her. Minato clutched Jin's arm to get his attention. Jin, listen closely, the masked man I fought, he got away before I could finish him, but I doubt he'd come back but that's besides the point. He was after the Kyubi. The safest place for it will be with Naruto. When he gets older, the seal will weaken and he'll have to take control of the Kyubi's chakra. When he does, he's going to need both halves of the Kyubi for the new seal to form completely. Jin nodded. I got it. After a few more heartwarming words from Kashina, she and Minato died in the other's arms. As if sensing his parents' death, Naruto began to cry. Jin did his best to comfort the crying infant but could do nothing to stop his own tears from falling. Goodbye, dear brother. Good night, sweet sister. He said as he said a small prayer. Jin sat there by their side until the other shinobi finally caught up. Through all the sadness, one dark thought lingered in Jin's mind. I will find the man responsible for this. And he will pay. Jin hated the rain, it was so ing depressing. He was glad that the second shinobi war ended before he had to participate in it as most of the fighting was in aim. Minato used to make jokes that the rain was trying to cool his hot-blooded temper. Kami how he hated the rain. Though if he were honest, the rain was appropriate for today. Even the heavens are mourning, Jin thought. The entire village, or rather what was left of it, was in attendance at the burial ground as they mourned for their fathers and brothers, mothers and sisters, sons and daughters, friends and lovers. Jin himself had lost his mother along with his brother and sister in all but blood. Jin looked up at the picture of his mother, Minato and Kashina among the others and felt his heart break again. How could everything have gone so wrong? He had to admit though, the damage done to the village could have been much worse, and more people could have lost their lives than the ones that did. Many were saying it was Jin pushing the Kyubi out of the village that saved everyone but he ignored them, he shouldn't have had to push it out in the first place. The Kyubi should have still been sealed inside Kashina and she and Minato should still be here with their son while his mother should right now be home cooing about how cute Shiba was. But instead, because of some asshole in a mask, they were dead. And Jin was stuck raising not one but two infants virtually on his own. He hadn't heard word from Pakura and that worried him. 
Naruto and Shiba were back at Jin's apartment, which was luckily one of the buildings spared the Kyuubi's rampage, with a couple shadow clones watching over them. Jin didn't think it was a good idea to have those two out of the house for a while, especially Naruto. With his red hair and whisker marks, he didn't need some idiot thinking that Naruto was the Kyuubi and try to attack him, Jin didn't need to add more people to his body count so soon after fighting the Kyuubi. After the funeral ended, almost immediately a meeting was called for all elite Jonin level ninja and the clan heads were all in attendance. Everyone took their seats as the elders, Kaharu and Homura, the former third Hokage and Danzo started the meeting. Jin mostly tuned them out until the subject of a new Hokage came up. He perked up slightly, wondering who would take Minato's place. As long as it wasn't Danzo, he was fine with whoever became the fifth Hokage. He was however taken back when Shikaku Nara, the Jonin commander spoke up. As far as the fifth Hokage goes, the perfect choice would be the man who was Minato's equal. Not to mention, he was Minato's assistant and advisor. In short, I nominate Jin Serutobi as fifth Hokage. Shikaku's suggestion was met with many sounds of approval from the other Jonin and most of the clan heads. The ones that didn't were Fugaku Uchiha and Hiyashi Hayuga, though Jin suspected both men had sticks shoved up their respective asses. Jin did work closely with Minato and probably would handle the village in a similar way, Kaharu commented. It would indeed be wise to have Jin be the Hokage, he was in the running for fourth before he dropped out, Homura added. Jin looked around the room and gauged everyone's reactions. Jin saw approval on the faces of many. He saw Danzo didn't look pleased but that wasn't too surprising. He however noticed his father's expression remained blank. His attention was taken from his father when Danzo stood to speak. Are we certain that Jin would make the best choice to leave the village? He started. Several people frowned at his tone. After all, even though you pushed the Kyubi out of the village and helped seal the beast, you failed to save the fourth Hokage. That remark was immediately met with outrage from several Jonin and a few clan heads, that was a low blow. The chatter was brought to an immediate halt when a massive amount of killer intent flooded the room along with the temperature increasing dramatically. The Jonin were gasping for breath, the clan heads were sweating, Kaharu and Homura looked greatly disturbed. Danzo however was having the worst reaction as killer intent was focused on him. Hiruzen was the only one who didn't look bothered by the increased heat or the killer intent as he stared at the source. Jin was sitting with his head lowered. The way you speak, you sound as if you're insinuating that Minato needed saving. He said as he stood up, the people near him gave him a wide berth. If that's what you're saying, then you obviously had no respect for your cage. Jin continued as he slowly walked forward, his head still lowered so his eyes were hidden. It's strange, during the attack, I could sense just about every shinobi in the village was front and center doing what they could to protect the village. Hell even our esteemed elders Kaharu and Homura and our former third Hokage were front and center, ready to die to defend their home. He said as he stopped in front of the Danzo, which of course brings up a very good question. He paused as he got right in Danzo's face revealing his eye that were no longer a vibrant green but blazing amber as he glared into Donzo's eye. Where the were you old man, cowering away in your little underground shithole while the rest of us risked our lives to protect our home? You're always the first to speak of the betterment of the village yet when shit hits the fan you're mysteriously nowhere to be found. And now you have the audacity to accuse me of letting my best friend die. I strongly suggest you watch yourself old man. Just because you survived this long doesn't mean your life can't come to a swift end. Jin said as stood up straight again. The killer intent subsided and the heat returned to normal causing everyone to sigh in relief minus Hiruzen, who had an unnoticeable smirk on his face. Jin turned to the others in the room, his eyes back to being green, as if he didn't just threaten one of the village elders. Something you all should know, Minato willing gave his life, doing what any good cage does, protecting his village. I want everyone in this room to remember that, he said as he saw everyone slightly bow their heads, giving their late cage another prayer. As for the subject of me taking the title of fifth Hokage, I'm sorry to say but I must decline. He said, this was met with sounds of disapproval. Jin raised his hands to silence them. I know, I know, but I can't. When I dropped out of the running for fourth, it was because I knew Minato would make a better cage than I. And had this situation been different I would gladly take the hat in his place. 
Then why won't you take over now? Asked the Inazuka clan head soon. Jin smiled a small smile. As it stands, I have two infant children at home that I am essentially raising on my own. I cannot and will not split my time between them and the office. He said. Another clan head, Inoichi Yamanaka spoke up. I was under the impression that you only had one child. He said confused. Until yesterday I only had my son, Zaiba to look after. However, I'm sure many of you knew that Minato and Kashina were expecting. That child was born yesterday and survived the attack, and as I am his godfather, I now have two sons to raise. Jin said simply. The clan heads and Jonan were going to let the issue drop there, however, Danzo brought up another issue. Are you sure it's wise to be raising that child yourself? Excuse me, Jin said turning his head back to the old fossil. His tone had everyone nervous that the killing intent would return. Danzo apparently didn't get the hint. For one thing, that child is now carrying the very beast that nearly destroyed our village. The very same beast that caused the death of your beloved teammates. Danzo said. Jin turned toward Danzo fully, ignoring the looks on some of the Jonin's faces. What exactly are you trying to say? He asked, his eyes flashing between green and amber. Danzo opened his one good eye and stared back at Jin. I am merely worried for the safety of the child. Naruto. Danzo raised a brow. Pardon. Jin's eyes narrowed. He has a name, Naruto. Use it. Danzo resisted a snort. I am merely worried for the safety of Naruto. You just lost both your teammates. I'd hate for you to take out any anger you have on the fox on the boy. The whole room went quiet. Homura, who was sitting next to Danzo, got up grabbed his chair, and walked to the far end of the table and sat next to Kaharu. If Jin decided to pounce, he wanted to be as far from Danzo as he could be. Jin himself blinked once, twice, thrice. Are you ing senile? Did you forget what team I was on? I was on a team with three, count them, three seal masters. One of which was a Uzumaki, a clan renowned for their fuinjutsu. I myself, am a seal master. Do you think I am so stupid that I could possibly see my son as that fox? Danzo raised a brow, your son, yes, my son, that is exactly what Naruto is. Both Minato and Kashina wanted me to look after him, damn near begged me as they lay dying. He is mine in all but blood and I will protect him as fiercely as if he were my own. So if you even think about mentioning your root program, that I know you're just itching to do, your little piss poor trained agents will not protect you and there will be no place on this planet where you will be spared from my wrath. He said as he flared his killer intent to get his point across to the whole room. Naruto Uzumaki was off limits. Now, if there's nothing else, I'm sure you can all decide a Hokage without me here. If you'll all excuse me, my sons need me. With that, Jin left the room. Not caring who became Hokage and confident that after that exchange, it wouldn't be Danzo. Oh oh oh, a week had passed since that day. As it happened, Hiruzen retook his title as third until a candidate for fifth presented themselves. Jin couldn't be more thankful about being a ninja since he had only gotten about a total of an hour and a half of sleep in the past seven days. Dealing with Zaiba on his own was hard enough, but now he had Naruto too. If one wasn't crying, the other one was, if he changed one, almost immediately after, he had to change the other. But feeding time was the worst. Both infants seemed to always be hungry. He had to make periodic trips to one of the markets for formula. Thankfully, he had help from Genma and Guy as well as Asuma when they weren't helping repair the village. Hitomi came over every day after her shift at the hospital, she had taken on more duties to help with those injured in the attack. Jin figured she did it to take her mind off their mother. He was so glad she didn't treat Naruto any different than she treated Zaiba. Speaking of Naruto, a couple days after the meeting, someone, that Jin was convinced it was Danzo, let slip that Naruto had the fox inside of him. So far no one had had the balls to try anything, but that didn't stop them from glaring. After word got out about Naruto, the third made a law that prohibited the adults from telling the children about Naruto's connection to the fox in the hopes that Naruto would be able to make friends. Jin seriously doubted it would be that easy, just because people couldn't talk about the fox didn't mean they could keep their kids from Naruto. Jin was currently walking toward the graveyard to bring flowers to his mother's grave. 
He'd left the children with his sister since she had the day off. As he was arriving, he sensed two familiar chakra signatures. Finding it suspicious that these two would be anywhere near each other, Jin suppressed his chakra and hid to get a closer look. Sure enough, there was Danzo talking with Kakashi. Listening in, Jin learned that Danzo was trying to recruit Kakashi for his root division. Jin narrowed his eyes as Danzo used Kakashi's love and respect for Minato to convince the boy and even blamed Jin himself for not helping Minato. What pissed Jin off is that Kakashi seemed to agree with Danzo. If Jin could just get some hard evidence on Danzo, he'd personally put the old bastard down. When Danzo finally left Jin casually left his hiding place. You know, Jin started, taking Kakashi by surprise. I've known Minato virtually our entire lives. We were practically inseparable since we met in the academy. He said fondly. What's your point? Kakashi said rather crossly. Jin looked at the younger shinobi. My point is I knew Minato a lot better than you did. I know for whatever reason, you were his favorite student. Jin said getting Kakashi's attention. I also know he trusted Danzo as much as he trusted Iwa Shinobi during the war. The point I'm trying to make here kid is that Minato recognized Danzo as the threat he was. Hell half the time we spent during his reign was dedicated to getting some evidence to expose him as the monster everyone knows he is. Jin said as he turned fully to the young shinobi and gave him a harsh glare, causing Kakashi to backpedal a little. Let me make this, perfectly clear. If I think for a second that you've become a threat to the village by joining Danzo, I may just forget that you were Minato's student. Hell, I may forget that you're a leaf shinobi, and deal with you the same way I deal with a threat from another village. He said. Kakashi looked disturbed now, it was no secret among the other shinobi how Jin handled threats to the village. Of all the ways Kakashi visualized he would die, smothered by molten lava wasn't one of them. Glad we could have this conversation. Jin said as he walked away as if didn't just threaten Kakashi, walked to his mother's grave, laid down the flowers and made to go pick up his kids, at least that was his plan. Jin walked two feet before he suddenly vanished in a cloud of smoke. Oh oh oh, Mount, Paozu, Jin suddenly stopped in his tracks as he took in his current location. Realizing where he was, he figured Gohan must have reverse summoned him to MT. Paozu, which meant one of two things, either something good happened or something terrible happened. Jin turned around and sure enough saw Gohan close by. While Gohan didn't have many facial expressions, one could tell by his eyes that there was indeed a problem. That's when Jin looked down and saw a tiny messenger monkey. His heart sank when he recognized it as the monkey that he sent with Pakura. He looked back up at Gohan. No, he breathed out. Gohan said nothing merely motioning his head over to the left. When Jin looked, he saw a hut. Figuring what Gohan was implying, Jin made a mad dash for the hut. As soon as he arrived, he swung open the flap and there lying on the floor with a blanket over her was Jin's wife Pakura. Rushing to her side, Jin kneeled by her side and took her in his arms. Pakura, Pakura, open your eyes love, he called out. This was not the woman he knew and loved, her skin was paler than normal and clammy. He had never seen her so weak. His horror increased when the blanket covering her fell off, revealing multiple stab wounds to her person. Pakura just barely managed to open her eyes. J. Jin. Pakura, what happened? Who did this to you? He asked frantic. Pakura's breathing was raspy but regardless, she managed to speak. I was double-crossed. The fourth, Kei's cage used me, as a bargaining chip, to make peace with Mizu. She gasped out. Jin couldn't begin to put his anger into words. That son of a bitch dared to use one of his own shinobi for his own agenda, he didn't deserve the title of cage. What made Jin angrier was that he realized why Pakura was used. Mizu was often referred to as the village of the bloody mist due in no small part to the bloody graduation exam and the blood purges. There weren't many bloodline users in Suna, Hell Pakura was the only one Jin knew of. Add in the fact Pakura's reputation, Jin realized that the mist must have demanded Pakura's death for there to be peace between the two villages. Now Jin wasn't sure there was anything that could save her. She had so many wounds on her body. The only person that would have a chance would be Tsunade but she was off somewhere wallowing in her own self-pity. What made it worse was that there was nothing he could do to help her or avenge her. 
There was no evidence to connect the case cage to this. Jin couldn't believe it. In less than a month a loved one was dying before him and once again he couldn't do anything. He hadn't even realized he was crying until he felt a hand wipe his cheeks. Looking down, he saw Pakura giving him a weak smile. I'm sorry, she said. What are you sorry for? He asked as more tears fell. Pakura smiled sadly as tears fell from her eyes. I promised you that I would be there to help raise our son. Now I never will. She trailed off before she gave him a pointed look. Promise me, promise me no matter what, you'll keep Ziba safe for as long as you can. Of course, you never have to ask, he said. Pakura smiled contently and caressed his face. You've made me so happy these last few years, I couldn't ask for a better man to be my husband or the father of my child. She said as Jin gripped her hand. Don't close your heart off when I'm gone, if you meet someone else, don't hesitate, love her like you loved me. She said as she felt her life ending. Jin nodded hesitantly, Pakura smiled before her eyes closed and she breathed her last breath. When he felt her go limp in his arms, Jin felt rage and sorrow consume him as he let out a sorrow-filled roar that echoed throughout MT. Pauzu. All the Uzaru lowered their heads when they heard their summoner's cry of anguish. Unbeknownst to Jin, back in Konoha, Hitomi was having a difficult time as Shiba was inconsolable, somehow knowing that his mother had just died. Shiba's cries had Naruto crying as well, followed by Hitomi as she didn't know what happened or what to do. It was only after Jin returned hours later did she know why. Time had come and gone. Much had happened inside the village. The bit of damage that the Kayubi dealt had been repaired. The village was starting to prosper again and the people had been beginning to move on. Jin had thought it might be a good idea to keep Naruto out of sight as much as possible so there wasn't a constant reminder in everyone's faces. Regarding the Serutobi family, things had become slightly less horrible. After his wife's death, Jin almost completely shut down. The only thing that kept him from falling into a downward spiral of despair was Asuma and Hitomi, as well as Naruto and Shiba. He took things a day at a time for a while, focusing only on his children. Eventually, three years passed when he finally pulled himself together when he realized Bakura would dropkick him if she saw him acting the way he was. Of course he kept a lot of resentment for the fourth case cage. It was a good thing he came around too as there was another family crisis that had revealed itself. Jin and Asuma had been too busy with raising his children and doing missions non-stop respectively to notice that Hitomi was having trouble adjusting to not having their mother around and resorted to finding comfort in the bottle. Jin wanted to kick himself for not registering Hitomi's problem sooner. When the boys started to walk, Jin bought a house close to the hospital. Hitomi had moved in as well to stay close to her brother and nephews as well as be close to work. Three times, Hitomi had come home drunk but he hadn't paid it any mind until now. Due to a drunken mistake that she couldn't remember, Hitomi was now pregnant. What made the situation worse was that she had no idea who the father of her child was. After months of wondering what she was gonna do, Hitomi finally decided she wanted to indeed keep the child. Learning of her choice, Jin agreed to help with anything she needed while being thankful he bought a bigger place when he did as there would be a new baby in the house. Shiba and Naruto as confused as they were, seemed delighted at the prospect of having a new friend to play with. A few months later saw Hitomi giving birth to a healthy baby boy whom she named Konohamaru, after their village Konoha. She did this in the hopes that Konohamaru would grow up to be a strong shinobi like his uncle. Even as an infant Konohamaru took after his mother in terms of appearance. He had the same brown hair, same brown eyes, he actually resembled his uncle Asuma but with Jin's hair color. Hitomi didn't care much about what he looked like, as soon as she held him in her arms, all the doubts that she had been having quickly vanished. With a new baby in the house, Jin found himself back to a familiar routine of waking up at odd hours of the night due to his nephew's cries. At least there was only one baby this time and another adult to tend to it. Of course neither Shiba nor Naruto were disturbed, a wall could fall over and they wouldn't budge. Speaking of the boys, Jin had slowly begun to train the two three-year-olds, of course it was nothing major, just little stuff like stealth. It all started when he discovered that Naruto had taken more from his mother than his hair and eye color, he also got her mischievousness. Add to that Shiba, who like his namesake was like a little monkey, and all hell broke loose when those two decided to prank people. 
It didn't really surprise him that the boys were advanced for their age. Minato was a genius himself and Kashina had more street smarts, while it was the opposite for Jin as he was the more street savvy one to procure his book smarts. The boys quickly learned that they had to quickly find effective hiding places right before a prank went off. Of course no matter how good the two got, Jin always found them. As they got older, Jin started teaching them more and more, but would still do it in ways where they didn't realize they were actually training. He figured he'd teach them the basics now and have them perfect them when they started the academy so he could teach them more advanced stuff as they got older. When the boys were five, he taught them the most important thing he could for their age when he took them camping, how to hunt and trap making. There was a slight snag when it came time for them to kill the rabbit they had caught, but Jin had an ace in his sleeve. Knowing that both the boys were ruled by their stomachs, he told them they had to either kill the rabbit so they could eat it or they'd starve. Needless to say, hunger quickly won out, that poor, poor rabbit. The biggest achievement was teaching them how to read. Jin had told them that reading could help fuel their imagination which would in turn help with their pranks. Kami how he would live to regret telling them that, especially when Naruto discovered a book on seals in Jin's library and figured out how to make storage seals. May Kami grant him her everlasting mercy. Right now, Jin was eating lunch with Hitomi and Asuma while Konohamaru was taking a nap and Naruto and Shiba were in their room being unusually quiet, which usually meant they were planning a prank on some poor soul. Jin used this time to really look at his little brother. Neither he nor Hitomi had seen Asuma in months as he had been going on missions non-stop, he looked tired. Members of the Serutobi clan always had one of two builds, slim with dense compact muscle for speed or large with broad muscles for strength. Jin was in the first category along with Hitomi and their father while Asuma was in the second like their grandfather. Asuma's larger frame looked sagged and tired. Jin knew Asuma was trying his hardest to get something that Jin himself never got and truthfully never wanted, their father's approval. Jin had a theory that Asuma was so dead set on getting their father's approval because he never had a true father figure. Jin got his fatherly approval from his sensei Jiraiya, Hitomi preferred the approval she got from their mother but the closest Asuma had was Jin himself, which wasn't enough. So, Jin started. What's wrong? Jin suddenly asked his brother. Asuma looked surprised. What are you talking about? Jin gave him a pointed look. Asuma, I've known you your whole life, I know when you have something on your mind. When Asuma didn't immediately reply, Hitomi spoke up. Is everything okay? She asked concerned. Asuma was quiet for a moment more before he sighed. I'm leaving the village for a while, he said. What? Hitomi quietly exclaimed so as not to awaken her child or gain the attention of the two pranksters into the other room. I said I'm leaving Konoha to travel. I need to find myself, find my own self worth as a shinobi, he said as he looked away from his siblings. Is this about father? Suma chan, you don't need father's approval to be a good shinobi, Hitomi said as Jin listened quietly. Asuma scowled. This has nothing to do with Lord Hokage. I learned a while ago that he is unable to be pleased. He said, though neither of the two senior Serutobi siblings missed the way their brother sneered the title in which they called their father. Asuma's face softened, besides, look at our family. Jin, you're known around the world as the Flame Emperor, a sulfur monosulfide rank shinobi with a flea on sight order in both Kumo and Iwa that was an equal to the fourth Hokage. And Hitomi, before you retired to be a full-time doctor at the hospital, you were easily a janin ranked shinobi that nearly rivaled Tsunade-sama in medicine. Our whole family is filled with such famous ninja and then there's me. I'm the black sheep of the clan as I'm the only member with a wind-style release. I thought I might be able to set myself apart because of that but there are so few wind users in the village that I even failed at that. I just want to get out of your shadows and not be seen as your sibling but as Asuma Serutobi. Hitomi was sad that her brother felt that way but when she looked at Jin, she saw her elder brother's face was blank. Without saying a word, Jin stood from his seat and walked into another room. Asuma and Hitomi could hear a bit of shuffling before he returned with a small box. Here, he said as he sat the box down in front of Asuma. At his brother's confused look, Jin elaborated. I was gonna give this to you for your Jonin promotion but it took longer to acquire than I thought. I figured they'd make a nice birthday present but seeing how you're leaving, you can have it now. Asuma opened the box and his eyes widened when he saw what was in the box. Reaching in, 
he pulled out two trench knives that looked like they would fit around his fist. Placing them on, he saw that they were a perfect fit. They're chakra trench knives, perfect for wind user, Jin said. Hearing that, Asuma pumped his wind chakra into the knives and watched as his chakra appeared and extended from the bladed edge. Sharpening his chakra, he watched how his chakra formed around the blade and formed an extended blade. I figured it would be perfect for your particular taijutsu. But, Asuma started. Why would you get me these? Not that I'm not grateful but chakra metal is incredibly expensive. Jin smiled. Think of this as my way of making sure you stay safe. Doesn't matter how old you get, you're still my baby brother, I can't help but want to protect you. He said as he placed a hand on Asuma's shoulder. Asuma smiled after a moment. Thanks, Nisan. Jin smiled back. Just make sure you say goodbye to Kuranai before you leave. He said with a smug grin much to Hitomi's amusement and Asuma's chagrin. After a few more hours of visiting, Asuma left. The next day, he left the village with his head high and his shoulders straight. If one looked close enough, they'd see the trench knives sticking out of his kanai pouch. Though he didn't know what awaited him on the outside of the village, he'd meet it headlong, just like his brother would. 000 nearly a year had passed by and it was almost time for Naruto and Shiba to enter the academy. Jin also figured he should tell Naruto about the fox pretty soon. Five years old he may be, but he was a sharp kid and both he and Shiba were noticing some of the looks Naruto was getting from random people, people they hadn't pranked. Naruto was smart, Jin was confident he could handle it, and since he was the one who sealed the fox inside of him, he knew it was his responsibility. But right now, he'd let them enjoy their time at the park with their friends, the Kyubi could wait a little longer. Not so surprising that they befriended some of the shinobi clan head's children. The clan heads didn't hate Naruto and saw him as a normal child. Surprisingly, the village was divided when it came to Naruto. Many of them still saw Naruto as the fox itself, but there were several that saw how he interacted with Jin and Shiba and pulled their heads out of their asses and realized he was a regular child. Right now, Naruto and Shiba were with their friends working on their tracking skills or in other words, playing hide and seek. Right now Shiba was it. Shiba was wearing a long-sleeved black shirt under a blue vest with black shorts and blue shinobi sandals. His tail was wagging happily behind him while his dark brown chin-length shaggy hair framed his face. What stood out most about his outfit was the red bandana on his head. He had already found Shoji and Shikamaru, one wasn't really good at hiding and the other fell asleep. The only ones left to find were Kiba and Naruto. Out of the two of them, Naruto was always the hardest to find since his stealth was as good as Shiba's own. He still had a good view of home base so he knew neither boy had tried to make a break for it. After looking more and still not seeing either boy, Shiba frowned before he closed his eyes and lifted his head slightly as he sniffed the air. For as long as he could remember, Shiba had a nose that could rival that of an Inazuka's with sharp ears and eyes to match. He figured it was something he inherited from his father since he could do it too. After several moments, he finally picked up the smell of a wet dog and followed it until he found Kiba by the river. All that was left was Naruto. Before Shiba could think to sniff for Naruto's scent, he picked up the sound the whimpering. Looking around, he couldn't immediately tell where the sound was coming from so, abandoning the game, he followed his ears to where the sound was coming from. Shiba had first assumed the whimpering was coming from a wounded animal, but as he got closer, he realized it was actually the crying of a person. Finally his eyes saw something pink in the distance and it seemed the crying was originating from it. When Shiba was close enough, he saw that it was another kid hunched into the fetal position. Approaching the child, he kneeled down to their level before he spoke. Hey, are you okay? He asked softly. The crying child lifted their head to see who spoke to them. When Shiba saw their face, he blushed lightly as he realized the child was a girl with bright green eyes, even brighter than his own. The girl had pale skin that highlighted her bright pink hair. And despite her flushed face and tear-filled eyes, Shiba still thought she was beautiful. The girl sniffed a bit before she spoke. W who are you? She asked, her voice slightly hoarse from crying. Shiba shook his head before swallowing the lump in his throat. I'm Shiba, what's your name? The girl sniffed a few more times before she slightly wiped her eyes. M my name is. Sakura. She quietly stuttered. Shiba looked confused. Huh, I didn't catch that. The girl sniffed again before she looked Shiba in the eye and spoke louder. 
I said my name is Sakura, she said loudly. Shiba smiled as his tail wagged behind him. Cherry Blossom, it suits you, he said with a bright smile that made the girl blush lightly. Why are you crying Sakura? Sakura sniffed again and looked to be about to cry all over again. The other girls make fun of me. Sniff, they say I have a big forehead, she said. Shiba looked at the girl's forehead that she was trying to hide with her bangs and had to admit that it was big. Well, it is pretty big, he muttered, unknowingly hurting Sakura's feelings even more as her tears began to fall again. But that not a bad thing, it's part of what makes you cute, he said casually. Sakura's tears abruptly halted when she heard the boy with a tail call her cute. But if it makes you sad that they talk about it, why do you try to hide it behind your bangs? Don't it that just bring more attention to it? He asked as he moved her bangs to get a better look at Sakura's forehead. Sakura finally dried her tears as she looked at the boy in front of her. What am I supposed to do? She asked. Shiba gained a thoughtful expression as his tail came around and made a makeshift chin rest as he scratched his head. Suddenly he remembered the bandana on his head. Suddenly smiling brightly, he took the bandana off of his head and tied it around Sakura's head so that her hair was held back and her forehead was visible for all to see. There we go, if you try hiding your forehead, you're letting the bullies know that it bothers you. Besides, your forehead's part of your pretty face, don't hide it, he said with the same giant smile. Sakura blushed lightly again at the boy's words. Before she could say anything, a voice called out, Shiba. Hey Shiba, where'd you go? Shiba. The squeaky voice called out. Recognizing his brother's voice, Shiba perked up. Sorry Sakura, I gotta go. Shiba said as he stood up and turned to leave. I hope I see you again Sakura, he exclaimed as he ran away. Sakura watched as the boy ran away. Slowly a shy smile found its way on her face and she found herself wishing she'd meet the strange-tailed boy again sooner rather than later. Today was the day, Jin had to promise himself not to cry. Both his boys were starting the academy today. Somehow time seemed like it sped forward and now here they were. Seemed like only yesterday he was changing their diapers. Damn. Jin thought. I'm damn near 30, when did I get so old? He thought from his place in line with the other parents with a three-year-old Konohamaru sitting on his shoulders with a tight grip on his uncle's hair. Hitomi had an early shift at the hospital so Jin was watching the boy for the day. Looking into the mass of children, he spotted a familiar shade of shaggy, straight red hair and right next to it was a familiar head of shaggy, spiky dark brown hair. That's one thing you could always count on with with his sons, one was never far from the other. Despite Sheba being about two months older, the two boys behaved like twins, like they could read the other's mind and what not. They'll definitely be on the same team. Anyone with eyes would be able to tell how good their teamwork is just by looking at them now. Jin thought. Suddenly both of his boys glanced back at him. He could tell by the looks on their faces that they were a little nervous about going to the academy. Catching their eyes, he gave them both a reassuring smile and a nod. Almost like a switch, he saw both boys' eyes light up as they smiled and turned back to look at the podium, where the Hokage was delivering the academy's welcoming speech. Jin's gaze went back to the Hokage as well as a completely blank expression appeared on his face. When was the last time he really spoke with his father? It had been long before the kids were born. He could honestly say he didn't have an opinion on his father. He was grateful to the man for having a hand in his conception and the conception of his siblings. But other than that, Hiruzen Serutobi was not his father, he was his sperm donor. He thought a part of him would feel bad about saying that but all he felt was hollow. If someone asked him who his father was, he say with his head held high that his father was Jiraiya of the Sanin. Speaking of said Sanin, Jin thought as he glanced to his left where the aforementioned man was standing next to him with tears comically streaming down his face as he muttered about his grandbrats growing up too fast. Drama Queen. Jin thought as he looked around at some of the other parents and tried to match them to their children. He easily spotted many of the clan heads and matched them up with their children. He maintained an easy friendship with several of the clan heads since he was the acting Serutobi clan head since Hiruzen was the Hokage. Funnily enough, he didn't even live inside the Serutobi clan compound. He noticed Fugaku Uchiha, like the asshole he was, looked like he'd rather be anywhere else right now. If there was one clan head that was not his cup of tea, it was Fugaku. Fugaku just rubbed him the wrong way, not to mention Fugaku hated his guts. 
It probably didn't help that when his oldest son Itachi was interested in learning more advanced fire style jutsu, he came to Jin himself and not his father. Back to matching up the kids with their parents, it was when he matched up Inochi Yamanaka with his daughter that he saw something interesting. Standing next to the platinum blonde heiress was a pink haired little girl who must have come from a civilian family. What got his attention, however, was what she wore on her head. It was a very familiar red bandana. Jin smirked. So that's what Shiba did with it. No wonder he was a bit embarrassed to tell me what happened to his bandana. Jin thought. What made it all the more endearing was that the very same little girl was taking some not so subtle looks in Shiba's direction only to blush and turn away when it looked like Shiba was about to look in her direction. Ah, oh, puppy love. Jin thought fondly remembering his first day at the academy. So, so long ago. Finally it seemed the Hokage was finished with his long-winded speech and officially started the school year. When all the students went inside, and with Jiraiya leaving with the Hokage, Jin quickly realized that he didn't have anything to do. Without his, big brothers, around, Konohamaru was rather quiet, plus the boy's mother's shift would be over soon so he wouldn't be watching him for much longer. Jin was only now realizing just how entertaining his kids were as he was totally bored now that they weren't around. He realized now that he had a bunch of free time on his hands and had no way of using it. I guess I could do some more training, he said to himself out loud. Here's where having a girlfriend could come in handy, a feminine voice said in front of him. Jin shook himself out of his trance and looked up to see his sister Hitomi standing in front of him with a mischievous smile. What are you on about? Jin asked. Hitomi walked toward him and plucked her son from his shoulders before settling him on her hip. I'm saying you need a girlfriend. You've been single seemingly forever. Granted that's probably because I never met Shiba's mother, but regardless, my point remains the same, you need to put yourself back on the market, Hitomi said matter-of-factly. Jin groaned. Why are you so interested in my romantic life? Hitomi snorted. Because the last time I wasn't, you went and got married without me and suddenly wound up with a baby. Jin just glared at her. At least he was married when Shiba was born. Kami forbid he should mention her drunken fling which led to Konohamaru, then he'd be the bad guy. Would it get you off my back if I said I'd consider it? No, but it's a good start, Hitomi said with a chuckle before she suddenly turned serious. Are the boys gonna be okay? Jin was the one to smirk now. Oh, they'll be fine. I had a nice chat with all the faculty members. Hitomi snorted again knowing that, chat, really meant threaten. She perked up however when she thought of something. You know, I hear that your fellow clan head Sume is single. That's because the crazy bitch ran her husband off. Jin retorted. He remembered Sume from when they were in the academy. She had always been a wild one, always ready for a scrap much like Kashina. The difference however was when they hit puberty. For some reason, that many med nin believed had to do with the awakening of their chakra. Shinobi in training all went through puberty around 12 to 13 years of age. Soom, after hitting puberty, was like a bitch in heat, trying to hump any and everything with a penis. It didn't surprise anyone that she was barely 18 when she had her first child. What about Orochi Tami's old apprentice Anko? I mean you were quite outspoken about defending her when half the village turned on her when she left with that sick bastard, she said. Well it wasn't her fault that she went after him. The news about that snake hadn't fully circulated around the village. As far as she knew, her sensei was just leaving abruptly. If Jiraiya's sensei just up and left when my team and I were that age, we'd probably go after him too, Jin said. Besides, she's half my age. She's 17, 1, Hitomi said. And I'm 29, no, Jin fired back. Kurenai. Oh sure, then when Asuma comes back, he can try to slit my throat. Then how about? Hitomi started. How about you let me handle my love life? Jin said with finality as they continued walking. Fine. Zero 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 a couple years passed by quickly in the village. So far the boys were doing rather well in their classes. Not one of their teachers, after chatting with Jin, tried to sabotage Naruto or Shiba, though that didn't mean they went out of their way to make sure they knew the material. Thankfully, his boys were smart. There was one man by the name of Aruka Amino who truly didn't seem to care about what Naruto carried. His teaching assistant Mizuki on the other hand gave Jin pause. He seemed nice enough, 
But Jin always had a sixth sense about these things and he couldn't shake the feeling that Mizuki was hiding something. Sadly, as good as things were, tragedy always found a way to show its ass. In this case, with the entire Uchiha clan. In one night, the entire Uchiha clan was slaughtered by one of their own. Itachi Uchiha killed everyone, including his parents. The only person he spared was his younger brother Sasuke. Jin had met Sasuke a few times when he would pick Naruto and Shiba up from the academy. He was a nice enough kid if not a bit quiet. He was constantly in competition with Naruto and Shiba at one thing or another. Jin would have tried to take the boy in, being that he was on somewhat good terms with the boys, but the civilian council swooped in and immediately made him a ward of the village making unnecessarily harder to adopt the boy. Didn't help that the boy had shut himself off from others. Anyway. The thing that had initially bothered Jin about the Uchiha massacre as it was being called, was how out of character it was for Itachi to just up and decide to kill his clan for seemingly no reason. Even him supposedly killing Shisui two nights before didn't sound right. Shisui body had washed up not far out of the village the next day, a random chunin happened to see his body when she was returning from a mission. That, and the massacre was two weeks ago. Figuring enough time had passed and things were starting to calm down. Jin headed over to the hospital to see if the autopsy on Shisui had been written yet. As he was walking, he couldn't help but wonder what would make Itachi kill his clan. There just had to be a reason behind it, otherwise, why spare Sasuke? That's the part Jin kept coming to. Having worked with Itachi and Shisui one time or another, Jin knew that Itachi was efficient with his work. If he were truly as heartless as people were saying he was, he would have killed Sasuke too. Could it have been due to Sasuke's age? He was the youngest member of the clan and the only Uchiha that was in the academy. No, there was definitely something Jin was missing, and he had a feeling it had to do with Shisui. Jin's thoughts ended when he reached the hospital. As soon as he stepped inside, he made a beeline for his sister's office. Sensing her inside, he knocked in a way that signaled it was him before walking in. Hitomi, he called. Hitomi didn't bother to look up from her paperwork. I'd figured you'd come eventually. This is about Shisui's autopsy right? She said finally looking up. Jin smirked. You know me too well. Hatomi snorted. Yeah, it had nothing to do with the fact that you've been asking for it non-stop since his body's been found. She deadpanned as she pulled a file out of her desk. Here, I wrote it myself, I'm sure you'll see the same problems I did. Hatomi said. She watched her brother's eyes skim through the autopsy report using her memory to keep track of where he was. When she saw his eyes widen, she spoke again. As you can see on the report, Shisui was in some kind of fight maybe an hour before his death, during which his right eye was violently torn from its socket by what I can assume was one of his attackers. The strange thing is, his left eye was also torn out but in a much less crude way, as if he pulled it out himself. He apparently died shortly after that from a combination of blood loss and asphyxiation due to drowning. I think he already sensed his life ending and just ended it on his terms. She said with a frown. Jin sat the report on his sister's desk as he thought about what he just read. Something still isn't adding up. Shisui was attacked by someone, but he was given time off around this time so he must have been in the village when he was attacked. His attacker was clearly after his eyes, and after his right eye was stolen, Shisui must have got away using the Shushin he's so famous for. If I had to guess, he probably sought out Itachi and gave him his only remaining eye before he died for safekeeping. Two days later, Itachi kills his clan. I doubt another member of the clan attacked Shisui. Unless he knew something he shouldn't but what? I mean it's no secret that things regarding the Uchiha have been rather tense but it still seems unlikely. But who else would attack Shisui? It was clearly someone from within the village and if not a member from his clan, then who? The only people that immediately come to mind that are crazy or stupid enough to try would be Orochimaru, who hasn't been seen in nearly 10 years, and Danzo, but even he wouldn't. Jin paused in his thoughts and narrowed his eyes. Danzo, he could attack someone with his root Anbu and be on the other side of the village, or if he was there he could have his root operatives wipe the place clean of evidence. The more he thought about it, the more likely it sounded. Hatomi watched her brother's face change as he thought of something everything okay. Instead of answering, he grabbed the report again and turned to leave. Need to borrow this. Where are you going? 
She asked as she saw the telltale signs of Jin's literal explosive anger bubbling just below the surface. I need to have a word with our father. Jin said as he left. Oh oh oh. Jin left the hospital and be lined to the Hokage Tower. On his way, everyone in his immediate vicinity gave him a wide berth. The heat radiating off of him was sweltering. For the ninja and few civilians that knew him, they could tell that Jin Serutobi had checked out and the Flame Emperor had checked in. It was a wonder that his footsteps weren't leaving trails of fire. Finally Jin made it to the tower and headed straight for the Hokage's office, ignoring the young secretary who seemed too frightened to even try to stop him. Reaching the office, he barged in without knocking. Hiruzen was relaxing, having finished his paperwork, while reading his copy of his student's book when Jin busted in. Hiruzen fumbled to hide the book. Jin, what are you? He started. Tell your Anbu to leave. We need to talk, Jin said with a low cold tone. Hiruzen narrowed his eyes but nevertheless did as requested and dismissed his anbu. As soon as the anbu were gone, Jin placed a silent seal on the door that covered the room. He then turned to the Hokage and placed the folder on the desk. What's this? Hiruzen asked as he picked up the folder. Shisui's autopsy report, Jin said. He watched as the Hokage read through the report. Do you see where the problem is? His right eye was removed rather crudely some time before his death. Hiruzen answered. He was attacked by someone in the village. I don't know who it was but I believe it was either another Uchiha, or Danzo and his root operatives. Considering the condition his body was in, I'm more inclined to believe the latter. When Hiruzen gave him a look that clearly said explain, Jin elaborated. It's no secret that things regarding the Uchiha have, or rather had been tense. I remember in the secret meeting, that you had me sit in on. Danzo was quite vocal about killing them before they could become a potential threat. I find it hard to believe that anyone else would just randomly attack Shisui inside the village. Just what do you expect me to do? Hiruzen said putting the file down. I expect you to act like a Ing Hokage. Jin shouted. How many times during your first reign did you tell that war hawk to disband his root program, huh? What happened to all that evidence that Minato and I compiled on him that suddenly vanished as soon as you took office again? Why have all the changes that he and I made to the academy and the hospital suddenly fall back to the old standards? And while I'm on the subject of the hospital, why the hell did you let Tsunade just up and leave? Is it because she's a senju because that's a piss poor excuse? The village's mortality rate went up as soon as she left. You should have long since called her back but you allowed her to continue drinking and gambling away her family's fortune in her self-destructive downward spiral. So she lost her family and lover, Bu Ying Hu, nearly everyone in this village has lost a loved one in some way or another. I lost my mother, my teammates and my wife, you don't see me off on a bender in some drunken swirl of debauchery. While Jin was delivering his verbal lashing, Hiruzen was seemingly getting older as Jin hit point for point. He didn't want to admit it but Jin was right. The standards of the village had drastically declined since he retook the hat. He thought he could at least maintain the village's welfare but he just wasn't the cage he used to be. Jin sighed. I always thought that the man that was too busy running his village during a war to be a father could at least run the village well during a time of peace but perhaps I was wrong, or maybe that man died in the war. Regardless, you, here's in Sarutobi student and chosen successor of the first and second Hokage are wearing the hat. You were responsible for protecting this village that the first, second and fourth Hokages died to protect. I suggest you get off your ass and get started. Jin said his piece and with a final glare he turned on his heel and left without so much as a backwards glance. Oh oh oh. It was only after leaving did Jin realize that anyone else would have immediately been arrested for treason for speaking to the Hokage that way. But given all that had happened between the estranged father and son, Hiruzen would be proving Jin's words right if he had Jin arrested for treason. Something that the elder Serutobi didn't want to do. Jin had returned home after his meeting with his father. The angry Serutobi had made a bee line to his kitchen, reached into the back of the cabinet for the secret stash of sake that Jin hid from Hatomi and the kids, uncorked the bottle and chugged its contents down. While his high body temperature dulled the effects alcohol had on him, he could still feel his mind relax. So much crap was happening around the village and something needed to be done. He was honestly worried about how the village would survive. 
So stuck in his thoughts, Jin didn't notice he was no longer alone in the kitchen. Dad. Jin looked over his shoulder and saw Naruto staring back at him. Something was off however, Naruto's eyes usually sparkled with mischief but now seemed rather dulled in comparison. Naruto. What's wrong son? He said as he hid the bottle of sake. Naruto looked down for a moment before looking up again. Um, I wanted to ask. Naruto trailed off, not sure how to continue. He wanted to ask why so many people seems to look at us like we're carrying some kind of disease. Another voice said. Jin and Naruto looked up and saw Zaiba leaning on the door frame, an uncharacteristic look of seriousness on his face. Jin sighed. Looks like it was finally time to tell them. He thought. Boys, sit down. There's something I must tell you. Jin said as he led the boys to the table. When they were all sat. Jin regarded both of his children before taking a deep breath and giving the boys a slightly averaged version of what happened nine years ago. The day Naruto was born point two hours, that's how long it took to explain to the boys the events of nine years ago. Jin was honestly surprised by how well they were taking it, especially Naruto, this tale did involve his parents after all. Jin did make sure to leave some details out, such as the splitting of the Kyubi's chakra and the masked man that caused all the trouble. He thought it'd be better to wait until Naruto was a bit older and strong enough to effectively defend himself before he learned about that. After all was said and done, the boys were rather silent. Jin wasn't too worried about Zaiba, he and Naruto had been inseparable since day one, he knew he wouldn't see Naruto any different now that he knew the truth. Even though everyone only glared at him through association, he stuck by Naruto through it all. No, Jin's true worry was Naruto himself more specifically how Naruto would view him now. Jin was the one who sealed the beast inside of the boy. Would their relationship become strained? Would Naruto hate him now? All these questions bounced around inside Jin's head before he was pulled from his thoughts. Dad, Naruto called out. He's still calling me dad, that's a good sign. Jin thought, yes son, what is it? Why did you have to seal it into me? Wasn't there anything else that could have been done? Naruto asked. Jin sighed. Trust me kid, I wish there was, there just wasn't enough time. HMPH, honestly I wanted to punch Minato in his perfect teeth when he told me his idea. The only other alternative would be sealing it back into Kashina, but she was not long for the world, the fox would have reappeared at some point. As harsh as it sounds son, you were the best of a bad situation. He said. Naruto flinched at the wording but it was no less true. Jin turned his attention to Zaiba and noticed a scowl on his face. Zaiba you've been pretty quiet, what's up? He asked. Naruto noticed Zaiba's scowl too and grew worried. Zaiba's scowl deepened. I'm just thinking of the stupidity of the villagers and some of the ninja. How can you justify blaming a baby for something outside of their control? I mean come on, do we live in a village full of moron? Zaiba said angry. Jin couldn't have been more proud of his son than he was at that moment. Well kid, as smart as some people are, humans in general are morons. Jin said before he turned to Naruto. I can't tell you how to feel about the villager's son, all I can say is don't waste your time hating them. If you have to feel something for them, then pity them for being too foolish to know any better. Naruto was quietly thinking to himself before he thought of a question. Dad, do you hate the Kyubi for what happened to the village? He asked. Zaiba stared at his father too, curious of his answer. Jin sat there for a moment before he answered. No, I don't, I feel sorry for it. Being imprisoned against its will for decades. I'd be angry too, but with all the forces out there that would use its power for their own gains, it's probably safer for the fox to be sealed away. He said. Naruto placed a hand over the seal on his stomach. Despite the circumstances, you're really the innocent and abused party here. He thought, I can't begin to understand your hatred toward us humans, but maybe someday, I'll be able to help change your opinion. Not all of us are close-minded. Naruto thought, unknown to all three present, there was another, giant pair of ears listening from within Naruto, who also heard Naruto's thoughts toward it. The Kyubi laid down on its front paws with a contemplative look on its face. The red-headed brat he currently resided in reminded him of someone from long ago. The same could be said about the younger hairless monkey in the room. 
The strongest of all bijus closed its eyes and went to sleep, dreaming of years past with two of its three older siblings. Oh oh oh. Three years later, life went on after Jin explained to the boys about why the village was divided when it came to what Naruto held inside of him. Not much had changed, though Jin did hear a lot more complaints about pranks on seemingly random people. He always laughed when he heard about those. It even seemed Naruto and Zaiba had Konohamaru come with them on their pranking campaigns. Hitomi wasn't too happy about that, complaining that his children were corrupting her sweet boy. A year after the talk, the Serutobi household got a little surprise. Asuma Serutobi had finally come home. Flashback. Asuma was sitting in the living room, requainting himself with his three nephews. He regaled them with tales from his travels from when he first left to when he joined the Guardian Shinobi 12. While that was happening, Hitomi and Jin were sitting nearby listening while taking their brother's full appearance in. Their baby brother had grown. Asuma now stood just an inch shy of Jin at six feet two. The 25-year-old's new height had balanced out his muscled frame to the point that his build was now similar to Jin's own. In fact it seemed like without meaning to, Asuma's appearance was slightly mirrored after Jin's own. If not for the beard and shorter hair, he'd look a lot more like Jin than he had when he was younger. I wonder if he realizes that beard makes him look older than me. Jin thought fondly. He looks happier than when he left. Hitomi commented. Indeed. I think he's finally found his place in the world. Jin said back. A few hours later, the adults were all sitting at the table alone catching up when Asuma changed the subject. Ni-san, after I get settled, I want to fight you. He said. Hitomi's eyes widened while Jin quirked a brow. You want to fight me? Why? Asuma's eyes hardened. Before I left, I knew I wouldn't stand a chance against you. You're an SS rank cage level shinobi and I was barely a B rank. You could have beaten me down before I even knew what happened. I'm a solid A rank now and I've learned a thing or two in my travels and I want to see if I could do any better in a battle with you now. Wouldn't it be better if you fought Hitomi, the two of you should be about the same level now. Jin said. Hitomi narrowed her eyes at her big brother. I'm not sure if I should feel complimented or insulted right now. Asuma shook his head. No. It has to be you. Hitomi won't give me the challenge I need. Now Hitomi huffed at her younger brother. Seriously, I'm sitting right here. You two can clearly see me. Jin shrugged. Fine, tell you what. When you're ready, I'll give you five minutes to do some serious damage to me. In that five minutes, I won't actively attack, I'll simply react to whatever you can throw at me. But at the end of those five minutes, I'll remind you why they call me the Flame Emperor. Deal. Asuma despite himself, gulped slightly as a bead of sweat went down his face. Deal. Noting Asuma's nervousness, Jin smirked. And just to slightly even the odds, he trailed off as he looked at their sister. Hitomi, why don't you fight with Asuma? Hitomi looked at Jin. Wait what? Jin turned to her. Did you think I hadn't noticed that you were training again? I'm a sensor type remember, I could sense your chakra getting ever so stronger. Besides, if you two fight together, it might actually give me a bit of a workout. He said. Asuma and Hitomi looked at one another before turning back to their older brother. Give us one week to prepare and you're on. Hitomi said. Jin shrugged. Take all the time you need. You guys have the type advantage. He said. In addition to being a fire type, Hitomi was also a water type much like how Asuma was a fire and wind type. With Jin being a fire and earth type, both younger siblings had a nature type that was stronger than Jin's. However, both younger siblings knew they would have to watch out for Jin's lava-style jutsu. You're on, Hitomi and Asuma said. Oh oh oh. One week later, word had got around about the two-on-one Serutobi sibling battle. A small crowd had formed around the area in which the three siblings were about to begin their battle. Some of the notable members in the crowd were classmates of Asuma. Even Jin's old Genin team had shown up. There was even a betting pool going with a 8 halves ratio in Jin's favor. Down on the field, Jin stood on the opposite side of the field of Hitomi and Asuma. Training ground 15 was the area that Hitomi had picked for them to fight. It was an open grassy area devoid of trees with a large lake nearby. The lack of trees was a double-edged sword as it meant there was no coverage around for anyone to hide behind. 
but it was made perfect for Asuma's wind style and the large lake was exactly what Hitomi needed for her water style. Both Asuma and Hitomi knew that they'd have to be quick if they were to have a chance. If they could just injure Jin in the five minutes before he started fighting back. So, are you two ready? Jin shouted from his end. Neither Hitomi or Asuma spoke, but Jin did notice they tensed up. Jin smirked as he crossed his arms, completely relaxed. Well then, he trailed off as he closed his eyes and unraveled his tail from his waist. Let's get started. Wasting no time, Asuma weaved through hand signs. Fire style. Burning ash. Asuma spewed out a large amount of chakra-infused gunpowder out at Jin. As soon as it reached, he clicked his teeth to ignite it. Jin with his eyes still closed, jumped to the side before the blast could hit him. Meanwhile, Hitomi had run closer to the water while going through several hand signs. As soon as she got close enough she finished. Water style. Water dragon bullet. The water churned before it shot out and formed a dragon that roared before shooting after Jin. Jin's tail twitched as he waited until the last minute to jump over the water dragon as it crashed into the spot where he once was. Jin spun in the air before landing harmlessly on the ground, still with his eyes closed. His tail twitched as he ducked under a punch thrown by Asuma with his trench knives on. Jin bobbed and weaved through each strike, dodging further to avoid the extended reach the blade had due to Asuma's wind chakra going through it. Suddenly Jin's tail furrowed as he jumped and back flipped over Hitomi to avoid her chakra scalpel. Asuma quickly weaved through hand signs. Wind style. Dust storm jutsu. Asuma called as he breathed out a thin trail of high velocity wind containing sharp dust particles. Jin landed and dropped to all fours as the wind sailed over him. Jin's tail twitched again and he jumped to the left to avoid another chakra scalpel coming down on his position. Hitomi growled in frustration. We're running out of time. She thought frantically. Asuma. She called her younger brother over. Asuma rushed to her side, having an idea what she had planned. It's what they spent the week preparing. Once Asuma was by her side, the two weaved through two separate hand signs. Fire style. Fire dragon bomb. Hitomi breathed out a stream of fire. Wind style. Whirlwind fist. Asuma punched out a giant whirlwind that combined with the stream of fire turning it white hot. The white hot flame raced toward a still Jin. Jin finally cracked open his eyes as a smile found its way on his face. Time's up, he muttered as the fire overtook him. The following explosion shook the training ground. Many of the onlookers watched on in awe at the firepower used while some worried for Jin. Did we get him? Asuma said as he and Hitomi watched the smoke for any sign of movement. I doubt it, be on your guard, Hitomi warned as she tensed up, a drop of sweat going down her brow. She understood better than Asuma just how powerful their older brother was. Honestly just the thought of the difference in strength between us makes my feet sweat, wait what? Hitomi thought as her gaze shot downward where she saw orange cracks forming in the ground under them. She could feel the heat from the cracks and knew what was coming. Asuma moved, she cried out frantically as she jumped away. No sooner had Asuma jumped out of his spot had the ground exploded and lava erupted from underneath. More lava erupted around the area and flowed around until it formed a type of moat that kept them confined inside it while cutting them off from the water. The ground inside the moat was scorched black with orange burning cracks that made it uncomfortable for them to stand on. The only opening that they could have possibly escaped from was suddenly cut off as a giant earth pillar burst from the ground and towered over them. Atop the pillar staring down at them was their brother. He stood there with his arms crossed with a glare on his face as he stared down at them as if he was looking past the surface, staring into their souls. That's when they saw it and felt it. Jin had tensed as chakra burst from every pore of his body, surrounding him in a blue cloak of energy at one. They felt the chakra weigh them down and suddenly felt their chances of winning drop to zero. Suddenly Jin vanished. Asuma and Hitomi grew shocked looks on their faces that quickly became unnerved when an arm appeared over each of their shoulders and something metal was pressed to their necks. Turning slightly, they saw Jin with a smirk on his face. I win, he said simply as he lowered the kunai from their necks and walked forward a few feet. He breathed in as he raised his arms and exhaled as he slowly lowered them in front of his chest. As he did this, the lava and scorched land cooled and hardened back to normal earth as the earth pillar cracked and fell to the ground. 
With his task finished, Jin turned back to his siblings and sweat dropped not just at the perturbed looks on his siblings, but the odd looks on many of the spectators. What? He said simply. Flashback end. Many had heard speculation over Jin's abilities but very few had actually bared witness the Flame Emperor's power. After that thoroughly one-sided annihilation, for surely it was not a battle, no one questioned the legitimacy of Jin's power. The few sensor types in the crowd nearly shit themselves when Jin's chakra went wild. It had nearly approached tailed beast levels before it vanished as quickly as it appeared. One question did appear in the minds of many of the people watching. Jin was powerful, a natural leader and was looked at in a favorable light by the feudal lord himself, so why hadn't taken the title of Hokage from the third yet? There were very few who would challenge his rule. What no one except maybe Hitomi knew was that Jin believed that he wasn't fit to lead an entire village, that he served Konoha better as a soldier and not a leader. The fact was that he was intimidated by that seat. His father sat there for 50 plus years and because of it, he practically ignored his family. Jin feared that would happen to him if he became Hokage. While true, the Hokage was supposed to see the whole village as his family, it was no excuse to ignore one's real family. Minato didn't have that problem, but then again, Minato was only Hokage for just over a year before he died. Who knows what would have happened if he survived. Though, despite that, Jin knew that there was very few choices for an effective Hokage. Other than himself, there was Jiraiya, who had to manage his spy network as well as being too preoccupied with his research. There was also Kakashi to consider but he spent so much time at the memorial stone wallowing in self-pity that he wouldn't be a suitable choice. The only other person wasn't even in the village. Tsunade Senju was arguably born for the job, being the granddaughter and grandniece of the first and second Hokages. But with her gambling addiction and alcoholism, she was by far the worst choice for Hokage. As much as he didn't want it, Jin would more than likely have to take the hat from his father and become the fifth Hokage if for no other reason than to fix all the things that fell back to the old standards when Minato died. He sensed that the day he would inevitably have to be Hokage was closing in on him. Currently, Jin was standing atop the Hokage monument looking over the village, ironically standing on the third's head. The day was still young and the sun was just beginning to rise. Jin continued to stare until his gaze landed on the academy building and he smiled. Twelve years. It's finally time. He thought knowing today was the day his boys would become ninja. It seemed like it was yesterday that he was changing diapers. I'd better go, they're planning their last and greatest prank today. Better find a good seat. He thought fondly as he shushined away. Oh oh oh, Serutobi household. It was 5.58 in the morning inside the Serutobi household. All was quiet and dark. Only two of its occupants were up and were creeping down the hall silently as to not awaken the lone adult still in the house. The two sneaks crept up to a bedroom door and silently opened it and crept in. Inside the bedroom on the bed was one lone occupant snoring away in their sleep, completely ignorant to the two intruders in the room. The person on the bed was male with spiky red hair and three whisker marks on each cheek. The two sneaks looked at each other with mischievous grins. You ready co? The taller one asked. You bet ni san. The shorter one said as he bent his knees. The shorter of the two jumped in the air and landed feet first in the gut of the sleeping occupant. The sleeping boy jerked up and was about to yelp before the other sneak placed a hand over his face. The sleeping boy gripped his stomach as he blinked the sleep from his eyes before looking at his attackers. From the bit of light that shined through the blinds, he recognized the two other in the room instantly. Konohamaru. Zaiba. What the hell? He wheezed. The two Serutobis smirked at him. Come on Naruto, get up. Today's the day, it's our last chance to do a prank before we become ninja. Zaiba said. Yanni san, hurry up and get dressed. Konohamaru said. Naruto grumbled slightly about evil brothers who woke him up before he got out of bed. Okay, okay, I'm coming. We'll meet you outside, and keep quiet. Aunt Hitomi is still sleeping. Zaiba said as he and Konohamaru left the room. After quickly going about his morning rituals, Naruto exited the house fully clothed. He was wearing a black jumpsuit with the jack currently tied around his waist with an orange shirt with a black swirl on the front. He wore blue shinobi sandals and black goggles on his on his head. Looking up, 
he saw his brothers Zaiba and Konohamaru standing in front of several cans of paint. Are we ready? He said with a giant grin. Zaiba was wearing forest camo pants tucked into his blue shinobi sandals. He had on a black tank top with black fingerlies gloves. His tail was wrapped around his waist and hidden under the black jacket tied around his waist. He also had a pair of goggles around his neck. Yeah, let's go. Wahoo, this is gonna be fun. Konohamaru exclaimed. He was wearing a pair of gray shorts with a yellow shirt with a Konoha symbol on it. He like his older brothers had a pair of goggles on his head. The three boys grabbed up the paint cans and made their way toward the Hokage monument. It took just over two hours but the boy were done. The three siblings were at the base of the monument, somewhat covered in paint looking over their work. All three had shit-eating grins on their faces. Talk about going out with a bang. Zaiba said. Yeah, we really outdid ourselves. Konohamaru commented. At the very least it's not the bad kind of vandalism. Naruto said. After basking in their success, Zaiba looked up at the placement of the sun. We need to go. Class starts in half an hour and we don't want to be here when someone finally looks up. All in agreement, the three boys fled the area, unaware that their father, uncle was watching the whole thing and was internally laughing. Looking at the Hokage monument, Jin saw all four of the faces completely covered in paint that made the heads look more lifelike. Given that their grandfather was the Hokage and the three boys spent a bunch of time in the office, it was natural that they'd see the pictures of the Hokages hanging over the window in the office. It made it seem like the past Hokages were watching over the village. It seemed that someone chose this moment to look toward the monument and suddenly all hell broke loose. Oh oh oh. The boys were all at the academy when the village as a whole saw the monument. Everyone had a sinking feeling that three certain pranksters were the cause of the facing of the monument but since no one saw them actually do it, no one could say for sure it was them. The boys couldn't believe that they actually got away their last prank. The graduation exam was a cakewalk. While Naruto and Zaiba weren't the best at the written portion, both the physical and jutsu portions were a walk in the park. While their scores weren't at the top of the class, they still passed. They were a bit worried about the jutsu portion as that took up 75% of the score and they couldn't use the normal clone jutsu due to their abnormally large chakra reserves. They were however allowed to use more advanced clone jutsus as a substitute. As soon as the day was over, the two brothers burst out of the academy doors and basically tackled their father who was outside waiting for them. Well hello to you two too. Jin said from his place on the ground. Dad we did it, Zaiba said his new headband wrapped around his right bicep. We've gotta celebrate, preferable with ramen, Naruto said, his new headband around his neck. Jin chuckled. All right, all right, just let me up and we can get ramen, he said. Wahoo? The two boys hollered before they both stopped before running back into the academy, only to come out a minute later with Konohamaru on Shiba's back. The group of four commenced on their way to Ichiraku's ramen stand, to celebrate Naruto and Shiba's graduation and Genin status. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.